everybody. Happy 2022 and welcome back to Phonogenics 101. I have some of my Patreon subscribers here, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you to my YouTube subscribers. Uh, if anyone's willing to sign up for my Patreon or send a little Venmo, I always appreciate the love. It keeps me motivated and um, makes me commit to these plans instead of canceling. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing something new. This is the first time for Phonogenics. We are starting a new series. This is the first time we ended a series, and then we're actually starting a new one for the first time since I started the podcast. So we have okay. our returning panel from the Stevie Nicks discussions, and we're going to talk about Fleetwood Mac from 1975 through present. So this is going to be an eight or nine part series. Uh, it's so great to have everybody back. And does everybody want to go around and introduce themselves? I'll start with my upper left-hand panel, Stephen. Hi. <laughs> um, I was ready to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve. I'm a big Stevie Nicks Fleetwood Mac fan. Next. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. Okay. Well, I'm um, I'm a big fan of both too. A real big fan. Um, it's it's that's why I'm here. You know, <laughs> the, the the band Fleetwood Mac and. And you know, the uh, Stevie went solo, but I like the other solo projects too. So, uh, and I'm from Sweetwater, Tennessee. Uh, used to live in South Dakota, out in the cold prairie. So, uh, that's who I am. I'm Jim. <laughs> All right, next is Nate Nathan. Hey, everybody. This is Nathan from Portland. Uh, it's nice to see you all again. All right. Next is Roland. Uh, <laughs> Roland from Canada. I've been a longtime fan. I've uh, seen Stevie Nicks, for instance, uh, by herself and with Fleetwood Mac 29 times. Yes. The and uh, I'm looking forward to this. All right. And the last on the panel, making an appearance from the Stevie Nicks solo tour on the Fleetwood Mac tour, just like Sharon Solani. And Lori Perry Nix <laughs> crossing over into the Fleetwood Mac universe from the Stevie Solo universe is yeah. Alicia. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I first found out um, I'm the youngest fan here. So, I found out about Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nix um, back in 2007 when I was in college. And then, um, after about a month of listening to Fleetwood Mac's greatest hits, I, okay, I pick up a lot of older bands. And so I start asking the questions and I went, I like this person, the one with the deep husky voice with all the mysticism. So I went do right into Stevie land for a good 10, 12 years. And wow. yeah, enjoyed Stevie's music and all her wonderful Stevie-ness. So then after listening to everything and getting tired enough, I guess, um, you can only listen to Rhiannon so many times, even if, it's, even if it's a great song. Or the Enchanted version, the piano version, which you can only listen to once. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, Stevie. <laughs> but, um, I started pulling out, going, okay, what, what else can I listen to? What's next? And I started pulling out a little bit of Fleetwood Mac and a little bit of... Buckingham solo material. Um, so this is kind of an interesting um, thing for me to go through because I know I've been telling Jeremy and he's probably excited to hear. I don't know, but I actually just got this record probably two or three weeks ago and listened uh, to it. Yeah. It's I think that's so cool, actually. I think that's awesome. Well, it's it's going to be part of your life for a long time. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean... When I pull out these older bands, I yeah. I guess I'm interested to hear how the younger crowd like me listens to it. Do you go to the record store and buy everything all at once? And then one Saturday, just gobble it all down? Or do you buy one record at a time and then, you know, kind of let that, you listen to that for several months. And then once you get tired of album A, you go to album B and really enjoy it, you know, savor it. Because, um, and I've always done B, because I'm like, this is it. If you like this band or this artist, most of them I know I'm picking them up 
the last stage of their career. I'm like, this is it. There is no more. <laughs> you know? So I've been in, so this is kind of a, um, so I've enjoyed this. So I'm going to have a very fresh take on this yeah. record. And so each album, as we go along through the series, are going to kind of pick it up as we do the podcast. So it's kind of fresh. Yes. The, um, well, rumors is going to be the one that I've heard quite a good bit. I mean, okay. Obviously. Um, I did one or two listen throughs a couple of years back on tango and in 2020, um, when everything got quiet, I decided to actually, that was like, say you will year for me. I actually okay. got really intimate for that record, but the rest of, um, I know the Stevie songs, like I said, I'm a Stevie fan, but I really don't know. Christine and Lindsay's songs. <laughs> well, first of all, let me tell everybody that my second car was called the Christine McVehicle. <laughs> it was a Dodge Aries. So for me, I'm a, as big of a Christine fan as I am a Stevie fan. Good. And then I do love Lindsay too. I have all the solo stuff, but he's probably my least favorite, but I love him. Like I love Lindsay. So I, I, saying like he's my least favorite is not accurately representing because he's probably like my favorite male <laughs> guitarist of all well besides prince all right i don't know i love lindsey buckingham <laughs> um so tonight we're talking about the fleetwood mac self-titled album it's called the white album sometimes um this is the second album in their repertoire called fleetwood mac which makes it a little bit confusing because there's two self-titled um the original debut album is called peter green's fleetwood mac right but the just yes, yes yeah <laughs> um so interesting my mom cleaned houses in the 70s late 70s and she would always play rumors and then this album and that rumors was like that's when it was really hot like 78 79 and it, it rumors was such a warm album and it has kind of those warmer black and white what is it sepia is that how you say it Se how do you say that word sepia sepia yeah it has the tone. Sepia? so this album was like a, a little it wasn't rumors to me, but it had this black and white cover, and it wasn't as warm as rumors. Th those are my first impressions, like as a four year old. But I used to, my mom had a vacuum cleaner. I used to pretend I was Christy McVie singing into the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> so from a, from before I even set foot in a school, elementary school or anything, I wanted to be Fleetwood Mac, Christy McVie. So you know, then. Middle school came along and I got really into Madonna and Prince and then Joni Mitchell. So, you know, I always still did love Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac, but I wasn't really listening to them. And my mom gave me a cassette of the Fleetwood Mac album. And I hadn't heard it in many years, probably since I was a kid, all the way through. Like, I knew the hits. But, like, hearing Landslide again, I was like, holy shit, this song's good. Because in 1990, Landslide wasn't a classic like it is now. It was kind of a deep album cut. It wasn't even a single so hearing that song again, I was like, holy shit. And then it got a little bit of prominence because Smashing Pumpkins covered it. So in the alternative grunge scene, we're like, oh, Smashing Pumpkins covered Landslide. And then it really went into the national prominence when the dance came out and she had her live version. This one's for you, daddy. So that's when <laughs> <laughs> that's when Landslide as part the of the Dixie Chicks version, too. Yeah, the, the Dixie <laughs> Chicks. Yeah. So now I feel like it's part of the American songbook. Like it's such a... Mm -hmm. A legendary piece of work but not in 1990 back then it was just kind of a deep album cut that was beloved and uh, all right let's start off with the album cover we have mick fleetwood with a uh, clean shaven mick fleetwood with a john mcv we have the crystal ball um on the inside there's a picture of the band yeah. mm -hmm. it kind of looks like christy mcv has a maxi pad underneath her pants Oh, oh. <laughs> Stevie, Stevie Nicks has brown. It looks like her hair is brown in this picture, doesn't it? Yeah. It's such a weird picture. Yeah, or natural color. So uh, here's the, the deluxe edition, but you can see the bigger album. Uh, okay. I guess the legend is that Bob Welsh, their guitarist for a few albums, had quit the band because he wanted to go solo. They had released Heroes Are Hard to Find, which was another black and white album cover. Um, so with Bob Welsh gone, Mick Fleetwood was trying to figure out who to put in the band. And he was in Sunset Sound. Is that the studio? Is that correct? 
No, no, it's uh, Sound, Sound City. City. Sound City. Okay, p- perfect. Now, some assholes always want to go on my fucking page and be like, this host is stupid. He should have done his research. We're just doing this for fun, and I'm just talking from my memory and my heart. I'm making like $10 an episode. So if anyone doesn't like my wealth of knowledge, subscribe to my Patreon so I can quit my day job and sit on Wikipedia all fucking day. <laughs> Rant over. So they're in Sound City. Yes. If, if I'm remembering wrong, anyone correct me. Keith Olson. Keith Olson wanted to demonstrate the speaker, so he played Frozen Love from Buckingham Knicks. Yeah. And Mick sure. Fleawood was wanted that guitar player. So he invited Lindsey Buckingham, but he said he could only join the band if his girlfriend Stevie came along. Is that the the legend? Yep. Yeah. So didn't they not meet at a Mexican restaurant yep. on New Year's uh-huh. Eve, right? Mm-hmm. And Steve was dressed in her work clothes. <laughs> it was either yeah. New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. That's right. New Year's yeah. wagons. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. <laughs> so it must have been 1974. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine being at the booth next to them in that restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of drunks. <laughs> you know, Christine. You drunk know, Christine drink. had a stiff drink in front of her. There's no doubt about yeah. it. Um, or running into all down. of them in a bathroom, like this picture here. Yeah. <laughs> now, some of these songs <laughs> were jeans. were written and demoed for the second Buckingham Knicks album. So some of these songs were already floating around the CV Lindsay universe. And the legend is they had their very first rehearsal. They all were in a rehearsal room. The first song they worked on was Say You, Lo- uh, Say you Love Me. Okay. And when the, th- the three-part harmony came on the chorus, as Christy McVie says, she got goose flesh. Yeah. But can you imagine being... I'm like getting like tingles right now. Can you imagine being in a room the first time those three harmonies all sang together? Holy shit. <laughs> like, they knew it was magical. There's nothing like those three harmonies together. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like... There's, it's... it's you can't tell if it's, you know, uh, two women and a man. It's just like they're just good harmonizers. And it just sounds like, like the old gospel groups. You know, you get males and, and uh, female singers together singing. And it's, it's an interesting sound. You know, right. you think two women singing with a man, it would sound more, you know, no. female. It just sounds like Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Because Christine and Stevie's voice are a little bit different than other women, so you put <laughs> Lynn. Roland, you had your hand up. Yeah, jump in ahead if you really want to hear the three of them sing really beautifully and well. Jump ahead to Tusk on Honey High. Oh exactly. yeah, that fade out is beautiful, the best. Beautiful. Yeah. I I rewind that and listen to it over and over, like the last mm. twenty seconds of the song. Okay, so. Um, any thoughts on the album cover before we move into the track by track? Yeah, Stevie and Jeans. Stevie and Jeans. Stevie and Jeans back then before the uh, shawls and... Before the uniform? Platform. The uniform, yeah. <laughs> Nathan. If, um, just one, I read today that uh, this is the only one of their album covers that doesn't feature, or the summer competed today, that features half of, not like part of the band, but not all of the band. I thought that was kind of interesting. I wonder what that's about and represents. Oh. Does that not make sense? I'm sorry. It's with the exception of the dance, none of their albums, including this one, feature any more than like two members of the band. You know, the dance is the only album to feature the. Can you that's edit that true. out, Jeremy? <laughs> you said it all that out. The dance no. is the only album to feature the whole band on the cover. You're right, because say you will, you have to fold it out, and Mirage is front and back, so you're absolutely right. And here we have Fleetwood and Mac on the cover. Yeah, Yeah. Tango in a Night are hiding in a forest, in the the picture of the forest somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) I get it. Alicia. I find it interesting with the crystal ball, how they started with that one here, and then you have that with Rumors. Right. It would have been interesting if they had kept that going. And isn't yeah. it in some of the Tusk inner pictures? Isn't there a crystal ball? Isn't CB holding it in that weird photo in the beach house, or am I totally imagining things? Uh, not sure about that. All right. But I, I noticed Herbert Worthington as a photographer. Yep. Talk amongst yourselves. All right. Let's say something. What would I say? 
Yeah, so Herbert, as a photographer, again, we know he did nice pictures with Stevie Nicks uh, in the 80s. Yeah, that was a go-to guy. Great photos. Mm -hmm. Did he, I wonder if he photographed like other bands, other famous bands. He must have. No, I there's no did. crystal ball. Did, yeah. yeah. No crystal ball on Tusk. No. There's nothing like the Worthington photo. Okay. Uh, are you guys aware that this came out in a deluxe edition and a super super <laughs> deluxe with the album, the the the, the, uh, uh, the thirty three and a third record album? Oh, there, there, there. Yeah, the, the expensive uh, box set. Yeah. Uh, in the, I was telling Alicia the Fleetwood Mac deluxe editions are a little bit different than the Stevie deluxe editions because the Stevie ones you get all these demos and songs you never heard. The Fleetwood Mac deluxe editions. There's a few songs that were like outtakes, but overall, it's kind of like alternate takes. Yeah. More so. I, so they're not quite as essential as the Stevie Deluxe Editions, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Although, well, it, I don't want to jump ahead. Go ahead, Jim. It, it shows all these deluxe stuff on Fleetwood Mac, shows how a song is made. Right. On, on and you get a good vocal there here and there, and, you know, just, you know, whatever the same feeling that day. So, uh, and on this album, almost like those are kind of like demos or roughs. Lindsay added a lot of dubs and guitar on that. That makes what makes his album is, is Lindsay, his plan. He played, he can play any, you know, any, if it's got a string on it, Lindsay can play. You know, uh, I think that's what really sold this band early on was he's playing because it's a familiar style like the birds or the eagles. It's very radio friendly, this album. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there should have been more on the radio on, on this album. This is a little kind of a, a cool kind of a stripped down rumors or something. I mean, there's some just great work for well, three, three months to make it. Right. Coke, some, some booze, lots of booze. Well, the album was a slow burner. They, they were doing some touring. It didn't really start charting. By the time it started gaining momentum, they were pretty close to being done with rumors, right? Just like Madonna's first album didn't take off till Like a Virgin was done. So they had to kind of, they oh, couldn't release as many singles off the album because they had to get rumors out, right? They recorded this and then they toured, like, you know, in the South. Like they started in Texas and kind of worked their way to the Northeast. And I think that was before it was released. They were just kind of uh, beating it out and, and honing it down and getting tight. And then they released it and then they went on another tour. And then they started making some money. <laughs> yeah. Rolling your hand was up. Yeah, Jim is right. I think the album started charting slowly and it picked up momentum yeah. while they were promoting it. And it, it went to like number one eventually when they were out on tour. Right. And, was uh, I think Jim was saying that they were uh, radio friendly. I mean, yeah, because, yeah. you know, this one, they have different versions. They have Say You Love Me, Rhiannon, Over My Head, and Blue Letter as single versions. The single mixes, right. Enhance, and you hear, like, Rhiannon, for instance, there are, you, know, you hear these little tinkles of bells and stuff like that. There's more added stuff to it. Rumors, they never did that, as far as I know. Not The singles were the singles from yeah. the record, but this one, they, they made the... Yeah. Uh, they, they took the opportunity to add, like, to enhance, to make it radio friend friendly. On the radio, I got the album cuts. I didn't, I didn't, because I've been, I was listening to uh, the singles and like yeah. on uh, over my head, they just they just jump right into it. Right and on the, you know, that over my head, you can barely hear it on the radio, and then it just. I remember the first time I heard it, it was like it was barely playing and then it just started picking up. It was I thought that was kind of cool. And I do believe back in the 70s, uh, songs sounded different on FM than they did AM. So I think some of the single mixes were so it sounded better on the AM radio. And they were yeah, tailored more towards the AM crowd. They, what they did, they had, I think it was Michael Jackson's mixer or something. And they mixed it and they, they mixed it so it could sound good in a car. Right. Which it does, because I, I listen to this album in my car all the time. So. Yeah. Mm. All right, so track one. The, the new lineup of Fleetwood Mac, by this point, they'd gone through like four or five lineups. So people that were a pre-existing fan of the band probably didn't invest too much in this when it came out. They're like, oh, another lineup of Fleetwood Mac. Uh, yeah. Then it, then it kicks in with the Lindsey Buckingham song, Monday Morning. Uh, so, so begins the new era of Fleetwood Mac. 
uh, Monday morning, classic Lindsey Buckingham song, great chorus, great harmonies, uh, great guitar. I love this song. They still do it in the tours live sometimes, right? Uh, I guess not now. Uh, no, not recently, not, not recently, no. Did they in like 2009, though, like the Unleashed or whatever? I feel like it was in one of those mo more modern tours. Maybe not. I don't know. I'm sure someone will comment in my YouTube comments and let me know. Um, um, so what do you all think of Monday morning? I think it's great. It's a great opener. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great opening track. Yeah. I'm surprised it was never a single. Yep. yep that's what I was going to say. It should have been a single. It, you know, uh, radio back then was uh, the, the, the DJs had a lot of, you know, they can do what they want. And right. I think if a good number would have played um, like landslide, that's a tragedy that that never got uh, on the radio until later. That one was built up by word of mouth. And then uh, uh, the Dixie Chicks did it and just pushed it ahead further. It's amazing. All right, it says here on, on Setlist FM, they played uh, Monday morning in 2019. So they must have done it with the Neil Finn lineup. I thought they did it in the concert I saw him. Nathan? Here's my beef with Monday morning. I can't understand the words. <laughs> you know I mean, as if I know him now, but as for a long time, I, I would hear that song and on recordings and not know what in the heck they were saying. So that's my beef with Monday morning. You know, you gotta, you gotta enunciate your words sometimes. It's like, <laughs> I, I pick it all up myself. Uh Oh, <laughs> it's a great opening track and uh, it's a great opening track on the 1980 live album too. And it sounds amazing live. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. There was a radio station here that used to play it every single Monday morning. Get it? <laughs> oh, every okay. Morning, Monday morning, Fleetwood Mac. So it got played for that reason. I'm wondering if was that? annoyed that he did not get a single off this record. That's true. Whereas the, the ladies did. That's Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I never heard Lindsay until rumors came out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go even away. Yeah. And go wasn't away. there an ad that had a misprint that put... Uh, yeah. Lindsey Buckingham oh, they, by they Stevie Nicks and them, Stevie yeah. Nicks by Lindsey. Yeah, yeah. They, they <laughs> smash the ladies. The, uh, uh, Lindsey and Stevie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, do we have any other thoughts on Monday morning? Jim? Yes, it's a, a very breezy uh, opener. Just gets everything going. And I like that the vocal starts it. Fleetwood Mac is, uh, I love how they, they do stuff. They'll start off with like drums, only drums or a vocal, or just jump right in it on just different ways of doing things. And that's why I love, that just gets you kind of a, you know, a recognition of the band is that they vary their intros. You know, like a CCR album, they probably uh, just start the same way on all records. If, you know, they may or may not, but I'm just, uh, you know, and uh, it has a very, uh, it's like a very, it's a, like the Eagles, but heavier. Like Mick and John are really a heavy sound. The backbone of Fleetwood Mac. It's a, it's. I mean, it's Eagleish, but it, it's got, it's heavy. It, and I think there's some African rhythms in it. You know, something with the guitars and the drum being played. It's, it has something in it that is like not African American, but like from Africa. Mick was, he was in South Africa as a kid. And they, he might have passed a little bit. Like, Let's try this, and and that's what's great about this band. It's just like we uh, bring stuff from all over the world, and uh, and it's a kind of a Buckingham Nick song, but with a great rhythm section. You yeah. know, it it's a really it should have been a single. I mean, uh. I mean, I heard this, I mean, when I got the, I got this album like 83, 84, and this is the first thing I heard from that album, and I really liked it, and, uh, you know, on on that album went, it was the start of a great record. Okay, so I feel like for these Fleetwood Mac discussions, we should end each song asking the newbie how the song landed with her. Yeah. Alicia, Monday morning, as a new listener, what did you think? 
Well, I don't like it, but I grew up listening to country music. So, I mean, it has, that's what makes Buckingham good for me, I guess, is he's got that. Twang. Yes, that folk. Yeah. More folk, which the last tour they did, it was interesting that they pulled Campbell in. Campbell's a great performer. Please do not get me wrong. But I was like, it made no sense to me because Buckingham, to me, is more of a picker than yep. a uh, blues player. Um, so I was surprised that they didn't do more of the older stuff to offset that. Um, but I like Monday morning. Um, it's definitely something I like to play Monday morning as we're running <laughs> to work. Um, but it's upbeat. It's fun. It's um, a little rockabilly, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yes. Um, this was on one of their greatest hits records when I first picked up Stevie Fleet. Well, I say Stevie more than Fleet Mac, but I picked up their greatest hits before I really dialed into her material. And this was on it. So I've known this song, but like the next song, Warm Ways, or there's a couple others that I never heard of. So it was, this is actually a very solid record. It is a solid record. And it, it's consistent, too. It that really is. A, um, All killer, no filler, baby. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's a good way of putting it. They definitely brought their A-team. <clears throat> that was a very interesting for me, I guess, because everybody my age thinks Fleetwood Mac, and they go, oh, Stevie Nicks. And then you look at this record, there's only two Stevie songs. <laughs> right. Well, she wrote... Yeah. Idiots. He wrote Crystal, yes, but I mean, singing and everything, it's really heavy on Buckingham and Christine. Mm -hmm. Not to be mean, just it, that was an observation I noticed. Um, I, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry. Cool, Jeremy, Nathan. You might get a lot of criticism from that one, but. Oh, who cares? <laughs> I don't care anymore. I never cared. Nathan, were you going to say something? And then Jim's on deck. No. Nope. Jim, you're on deck. Did you have something? I'm with uh, Monday morning. Okay. So thumbs up, thumbs sideways, or thumbs down? Monday morning. Boom. Thumbs up for me. Good. Oh. Really? I, <laughs> I love Stephen coming in with the with the. No steel. hate for it. It's, just a, it's a good song. That's it. <laughs> a little bit of hate. That's why you went sideways. <laughs> All right. What does sideways mean? It doesn't mean it means it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's an okay song. Up next, she had been with Fleetwood Mac since their Future Games album. Uh, Morning Rain was her debut into as a songwriter in Fleetwood Mac. She did a guest on Kiln House as a pianist, but as a full fledged member, Future Games was her first album. Hang on, uh, Station Man, a little bit. Yeah, she sang on Station Man. You can hear. Her. Here, um, she well, yep. theoretically, or technically, she joined on the Kiln House tour, right? Technically, yeah. okay. after uh, Green, she replaced Peter Green. Basically, I mean, they need um, someone, somebody. Yeah, and she was married to the bassist. Uh, yeah. She had done one solo album at that point, the legendary Christine Perfect album, which I love. But it is all the drums are mixed in one side and all the bass in another side, so you have to. Put your stereo on my. I had a car. I had a punk rock car in high school, and only one side of the speakers work. And that's when I was into Christy McVie a lot. So I had to listen to the album just with the bass. Like I didn't, I didn't have the drums because the speakers <laughs> in the this side of the car didn't work. Okay, moving on back to Fleetwood Mac. Uh, she recorded some really really solid songs in the previous lineup of Fleetwood Mac. And I feel like a lot of the Christy McVie songs kind of led the way towards where they went with this album. Like, there's some stuff on Mystery to Me, Just Crazy Love, Believe Me, which mm -hmm. uh, were indicators of where Fluid Mac was going to go, in my opinion. I'd love to discuss those albums later, because I love those albums. Uh, but her Christine's debut in the new Fluid Mac universe was a song called Warm Ways. And it's very easy listening, very soothing. It's pretty uh, yacht rocky. It's kind of very yacht rocky. I feel like Michael McDonald is just sitting somewhere, like taking it all in. And Loggins and Messina were somewhere taking notes. 
Is there any fans of the? Is there any fans of the Office here? Does there, do you remember the episode where Stanley's like, "I never said anything about Messina." <laughs> okay, <laughs> Roland, take it away. This song is so easy listening. You know, it makes me think of I'm on a beach in Hawaii. You know, with a, uh, a yeah. drink with a little umbrella in in it. That's you're sitting on the you're sitting on the patio of Fleetwoods eating some clam chowder. Yeah, in Hawaii. Being charged a forty bucks or fifty bucks for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that in very, Hawaii very or Maui? Easy. It's not my favorite. Yeah, for a bowl. <laughs> A bowl, a bowl of chowder at Fleetwoods, <laughs> listening to Warm Ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, not my favorite, though. This is not one of my favorite Christine McVie songs. Okay. But I don't hate it either. Anyone else want to talk about Warm Ways? Okay, so Nathan, then Steven. Or Nathan, then Jim. I don't know when the last time you listened to it all the way through was, but there is a very cool section at the end where it just kind of breaks down the different instruments of it. There's no more vocals or anything. So the last 30 or 30 seconds or so is really cool. Anyway, yeah. that Fleetwood Max starts off their songs in interesting ways. A lot of times they end them. I do love that part. All right, Jim. It's, uh, I think it's just simply lovely. It's just beautiful. And, uh, it's a great Christine uh, troubled love song, you know. It a lot of stuff on here uh, she wrote sounds light, but it's very dark because you know her and John weren't getting along at all at that point, and um, it's got a uh, it's got an old Fleetwood Mac feel to it, the previous stuff. But uh-huh. It has Irwin kind of guitar work. And uh, are you saying that the lyrics to this are dark, Jim? Are you pointing out that the lyrical <laughs> content is especially morose or the tone? I think it's okay. something you're reading. Her voice is. I see. You read the uh, the words are kind of light, and you know, but the tone is dark. So, um, and uh, this is just a great piece of work. I love it. Uh, and I wrote here, uh, Sound City meets a great band. I mean, it, that was a great situation. Uh, you know, uh, Teen Spirit was recorded there and a lot of great stuff. But uh, um, it's very romantic um, with, you know, like dark undertones. And, in, and this would have been, a, this would have played on the radio. I think this would have done well on the radio in some you know, and at certain times, certain stations. Jim, she already had, she already got two damn singles out of the album. Give Lindsay a chance. Great, yeah. This is a great song. This is, is a great a thing. The mu- musicality of this is terrific. All right. Do Steven or Alicia have anything to say about Warm Ways? I do not. <laughs> Alicia, Warm Ways. <laughs> Mike, Tucson. I was surprised to hear it. I felt like there was a little, it has kind of like a slight R and B feel to it from the album. But I mean, you're right. It's very smooth. It's very easy listening. Um, I feel like this was a successful attempt to what Stevie tried to do with blue water on 24 karat gold. Yeah. She's trying to go for that thing, but this is Christine hit the mark. Stevie did not. All right. Sorry to interrupt, but just can't. Uh, Yes. That's a good way of, of comparing it. I, I can agree with that. I like the Blue Water demos. Those are just terrific. That's a tragedy. Well, that's one of the tragedies. Right, but that's the one off the of 24 karat gold. I, eh. But yes, <laughs> this was a good song. I mean, it, it's not, oh, wow, blew me away. That was Crystal, but it, it, it's a solid song and it's good. All right, any thoughts on Warm Ways before we move on? Thumbs up, sideways, or down? I'm going to give it a thumbs up. That's Mick V. Oh, we got two sideways. <laughs> All right, next. The Curtis brothers were recording in the studio next to Fleetwood Mac, and uh, Lindsey Buckingham decided to cover their song, Blue Letter, which is surprising to me that it's a cover, because to me it sounds just like a damn Fleetwood Mac song. Like, it doesn't sound like... I, th- I love... Lindsay and Stevie's harmonies on this song. When I'm driving down 
the Florida highway on the beach. I just sing the Stevie parts. Uh, <laughs> I fucking love Blue Letter. So, any, all right, who wants to talk about this one? Steven, I see you have a thumbs up. After giving the I first two songs to Sideways, why do you love this it? This is oh. where the album starts for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Blue Letter. Uh, it's just a nice little rocker. I don't have much to add to it. I always thought it was a remake, but I never knew who. So I'm glad I finally know who did it first now. And I never did go back and listen to the original. So it is a so it is a remake. Oh, I've heard that. Yeah, I listened to it. It's I don't know if it's a remake, but the the people were recording in the studio next Hold to on. them. Jim's got the story. Jim, take it away. Yes, uh, there you know, you got the first part right where they're recording on the other side, and uh, Fleetwood Mac recorded it, but I, I it I don't think the Curtis Brothers released it until a little bit later. Okay. Something like that. That was kind of what I read uh, yesterday. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit like, uh, I'm kind of like, they used to call this on the ledge, uh, a shipper. And, you know, this was written by somebody else. But I mean, Lindsay feels this, and the whole band loves the song, you can tell. And it's kind of fits in with their other work, how they yep. were feeling each other and all that but it's not like rote oh the the i read about what the uh silver ink on a blue pay, uh what did this it there was something about the blue letter and silver ink on it that like dear john letter and uh that's kind of was a method back then that they would have this ink that had silver in it or silver colored and then put it on blue paper and it was you know stationary and that's that's kind of the story how that was written. It's a great song, and the red bird part is the uh, Indiana State bird. Uh, the must them guys must have been from Indiana or something. So, the the cardinal. Um, most of the most of the Midwestern states. I've looked this up before. It's kind of funny, but most of them have the have the uh, cardinal as their state bird. <laughs> they fly, uh, uh, you know, they claimed it. I mean, that's the birds that are well, they're down here in Tennessee, too. So, <clears throat> All right, Stephen, I saw your hand was up. Yeah. Did you guys ever hear the quote uh, by Christine McVie about Stevie Nicks? Um, Sometimes you can't tell what she's saying, but it sounds so good. You don't care. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a very famous quote. That's how I think of this song. I have no idea what the song is about. And that's I kind of don't care either. The top of my lungs, but I make up all the words. I don't know what they're singing about. Like, an eighth, uh, like Nathan said, enunciate. <laughs> Those harmonies are glorious, though. Like, the Fleetwood Mac sound, especially with... So the, good. I hate so to say it, but Stevie's younger voice, when she still the, could hit right. in the higher register on the harmonies, it was, it was pure magic. Because, you know, now, now in the concert, she's like doing the... Like the low... Harmony, we, which we love. You know, Sharon and Lori are taking the high notes. But when Stevie could hit those high notes, the texture right. of her voice on top of that stack of harmonies was one of a kind. It will never be duplicated, ever. Because her voice is so weird. Fucking McVie's voice is so weird. <laughs> and then Lindsay's voice, like, the combination. I love it. All right. And it, it's so cool to see it done live on a Mirage tour video. Oh, yep. No, oh. and I think they brought it back for the 1987 tour with Lin when Lindsay left, and they might have done it more recently. I don't know with the with the um, Mike Campbell and uh, what's his name Neil Neil Finn. And, I don't think they did okay, it in 2018. Did they? Did they? I, I have to look it up. Not to my knowledge, but maybe. Alicia, your thoughts on Blue Letter? I was surprised. I really liked it. I like it. it the first time I listened through this record, I put it in the car. So this was like that surprise pick me up after warm ways. Um, and I, I liked it and gave it. There's not a whole lot of, um, this album has kind of a steady, we're all kind of mid tempo here. And you've got this one that really kicks it up. And then I would say we're all turning on both sides. So that's, so I enjoyed it. It was a nice break from the the tempo and everything. And it was very interesting um, listening to it. This record, as far as the lyrics, you could kind of 
you start hearing all the the dialogue that's happening, especially with Stevie and um, Lindsay. Yeah. Uh, Monday morning is talking about, is this right? We're not getting along. You have blue letter kind of yeah. in that. Is this going to happen or not? So it's interesting that it's. Yeah. It's great live. Huh? It's great live. Yes. It, the bottom, the kind of the up. conversation is being opened up and you have Stevie with landslides. So it's, I don't know. I feel like, Fleo Mac is almost like watching a soap opera, and here's the first episode. <laughs> Who do you think's um, right? Who do you think's wrong, Alicia? Just tell us. <laughs> and not I to mention was- on this song, what a killer hook, too. Like, yes. As far as like pop music, like pop rock, this song's got a killer hook. Like, I like Monday Morning in Warm Ways, but this is where, like Steven said, this is where shit gets real. And when <laughs> it has that Fleetwood Mac catchy hook, that the best of their songs have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This true. one through, like, what? what's the last great Fluid Mac pop song? I, I'd i love Thrown Down from Say You Will, personally. Yeah. I think that's classic Fluid Mac. But I guess we'll get there in a few months. All right. Any thoughts on Blue Letter before we get to Jim's five pages of notes about Rhiannon? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he told me, he's like, I have five pages of notes. Uh, thumbs up, sideways, or down on Blue Letter? <laughs> It's unanimous. Woo! And uh, for me, it's probably the the least favorite, but it's really good. Yep. All right. So Stevie Nicks' Surprise first me. Stevie's first appearance on a Fleetwood Mac album is a song that she had written for the second Buckingham Nicks album. If you go on YouTube, you can hear live versions that she was doing with Buckingham Nicks. They kind of have a more shuffle drum beat. It's a little bit different of a beat than Mick Fleetwood played. Um, and they definitely polished it up for the Fleetwood Mac version. Uh, yeah, it's so- interesting because the studio version uh, keeps the same chorus. All your life you never seen a woman. And the live, Stevie never did it that way. She always changed the the words in the second chorus. You guys know what I'm talking about? Where she's like, taken by the sky. In a million years. Will you ever win? Yeah, in a million, yeah. Uh, but in the Buckingham Knicks versions, I think she's singing the live lyrics. So I wonder why in the studio version for the Fleetwood Mac album, they uh, streamlined it and used the same co- words for the first and second chorus. So I'm 90% it sure on that one. No, Jeremy. I don't know. <laughs> Keep it simple. Um, yeah. Rhiannon, of if course, is one choose, of If it were multiple choice, that's what I would choose is those, so that she wouldn't mix it up. Yeah. You know. um, Rhiannon, of course, is one of Stevie Nicks' signature songs. Uh, everyone watching this podcast probably already knows all these things, but we're just going to do a quick little run through. Uh, the live version became a showcase for Stevie Nicks where she just started screaming like a maniac. And she, some people say that's why her voice dropped an octave. It's because during the rumors tour, she was going so crazy on Rhiannon. It she, didn't drop an octave. That's nonsense. That's just haters. She lost. She lost the top octave. She did lose the top octave after uh, two octaves. <laughs> yeah. Two- <laughs> <laughs> so after uh, the rumors tour, though, you can hear on the Tusk tour how even singing Rihanna and she kind of changes the melody and doesn't go for the high notes anymore. Um, that version. What's the version that's classic on YouTube? Or she just wails into the song. I think it's from the Rumors tour. Or maybe it's even from the... It's 76. Midnight, Midnight, Special. Midnight Special. The Midnight it's, Special. I watched I, that. That one's totally baked. <laughs> it cooked it. There's some performance of this where it just gives me goosebumps. Like, she she just put so much... Like, the amount of emotion that Stevie Nicks put into those live versions is kind of unmatched, in, oh, yeah. in my opinion. And that's Look why it's so hard... The- Go ahead. Look up some of the Japanese versions from like 77, 78. I think 78. They're incredible. Because really now we have like, like now she's been doing part. like 40 years. It's like dreams unwind, loves the state of mind. Like she's totally on autopilot. I kind of wish they would take out the end section because it's so boring now after the fire of the old days. Like just take it out. And they don't have the energy of doing that long, long instrumental like in the 1980 um, Fleetwood Mac live record. Right, can I give a hot take minutes. here? Can I give a hot take? 
I feel like the live versions of Gold Dust Woman have gotten better with age. For some reason, like oh yeah, that ending oh. section just gets more and more mystical. It works. Uh, it's yeah. I feel like it was just as enchanting in twenty four karat gold in the dance as it was back in the day. Mm. On the other hand, I feel like Rhiannon just loses more and more steam as the years go by. So that's my hot yeah. take. I don't know if anyone else agrees or disagrees. I agree. Oh, it, totally it's a lot it's shorter. Her mannerisms are just very, con you know, like they're, they're plant. You know what she's going to do next with her hands. And even you know, it's, it's unspontaneous like it used to be. And then and it's like, you know, a four minute song now. And it's, it's in the middle of the set. It's not a big deal anymore. So to speak. I'm no, going to do Carrie Gold. She left it at the end, but the Fleetwood Mac is like, you know, the fifth or sixth song. I'm going to do another hot take. The, the two <laughs> best versions of Ro? God dang, that's some heat. The best versions of Rhiannon, Midnight Special. Uh, the Tusk Tour, there are some great Rhiannons. Yeah. The worst Rhiannons, the Enchanted Box Set piano version. Okay. <laughs> and oh, I think the dance, drum. Rhiannon, don't go. Rhiannon, hey. stay. <laughs> Rhiannon, <laughs> Don't move an inch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm done with my rants. Jim. Well, Street Angel Tour is good, too. Oh, is it? Yeah, her Very voice came back. Her voice came but back. There's a lot of energy in that vocal. Yeah. Like, it's a really good Rihanna. It was the crimped hair. Like, the crimping the hair. Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> Um. So is that the last time Rihanna really rocked, in your opinion, was Street Angel Tour? That or the House of Blues. One, I'm not sure which recording it is, but there's a really good one out there. All right. Some somebody from the Ledge made a compilation of the evolution of Rihanna, and it had all the mixes on there. Whoa. Did you guys hear that? Like it's mm -hmm. the last one on there. It's really good. Which band recorded this more recently? Was it Haim or somebody? No, Haim didn't do that. Because Stevie's like they're hitting the the like, notes the way I sing it, and only one time. I on listened. The, I listened to William Jen Jennings' version. Oh, of Rhiannon? Rhiannon? I thought he did Gold Dust Woman. He did Rhiannon, too? He did too? both. He did both. He did oh, shit. Yeah, he did okay. Both. So I feel like we all have things to say about Rhiannon, but let's just, let's just let Jim dig into his four pages first. Let's just start. Jim, this is your signing. This is your moment. This is a two-parter. I'm going to do it from like an analysis. We're putting first. Jim on the spotlight. Oh, my <laughs> <laughs> okay. I won't do that. I won't do that to you. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the song fits in kind of with the legacy of Fleetwood Mac, like the Black Magic Woman, um, even Hypnotized. Uh, and it, it sort of, so the band kind of got, you know, the band had great music ideas to work, work the song. Bermuda Triangle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that too. Um, and on Stevie's voice, uh, I think um, a large part of it, she's double tracked. She sings over herself. She harmonizes with herself, which is, uh, I think the, on the Buckham Nick, she did a lot of that too. I, I don't know if the producer didn't have confidence in her voice. It wasn't full enough or something. And that's kind of what they kept doing. And uh, it's kind of a, a melt, uh, meeting of two worlds. Uh, um stevie's poetry and uh you know what in the drive of and the passion of fleetwood mac um okay oh this is a very uh when when you look at it deeply and lyrically this is a very empowering uh woman song it's very empowering it's like you know uh you know, she rules her life like a fine skylark, and it's there's a lot of strength in that. A lot of a strong female character. That's part of. I think that's part of the draw. So um, let's see. Okay, and and just to reiterate that, it was nice to hear a woman play or sing about something. I call. I like the. I like the um, black magic woman and. And, and there was another one from Santana, Santana called, I think, Evil Ways. You know, it's the dark woman character. And I, and I was in the uh, heart had a magic man that was more, you know, kind of the same uh, 
subject matter. And don't forget uh, Witch A Woman by the Eagles. Oh, oh yeah, that, yeah, that. And I loved all of them. So it was kind of like, cool, a woman singing like a lead. Witch A Woman? You ever see that episode of Seinfeld? <laughs> Where they're like, isn't it Witch A Woman? Okay, sorry, Jim. Okay, yes, yeah, I okay. Um, and it was, I just found it, I found it great that a strong woman, a woman herself, was singing a lead in a character as like a witch or an occult theme. And I, I thought I thought that was great. You know, about time, you know, because I love these other ones where the man, the, the man, you know, the man would sing about, uh, you know, a woman character, a witchy character or something like that. And it was like a woman doing this. This is just cool as hell. And uh, um, incredible lyrics with word economy. It's just really, a, it's just, there's so much in there that can be interpreted different ways. And, uh, okay, and it leaves a lot to the imagination. Uh, Stevie didn't want this released as a single. She said it was like art, and she didn't really want this to go to the public. I think it was like she felt so much, she was so tied to it. And if it fell, and she said, if this failed, it just, it's going to make, it's her failing too. So she was, there was a lot of tense for, you know, you know, uh, she had a lot of reservations about this being put out to the, because this is a, I mean, when you think about lyrics and, and this has a lot of different things, you know, to interpret. And I don't know if the regular listener, she was probably worried about the regular listener just picking up on it or not, but there you go. It, it worked for a lot of people. Jim, was That's that everything? Part one. Oh, all right. So let's, uh, we'll go around the panel before we get to part two for Jim. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite parts of the song is the first time you hear the combination of Stevie Nicks and Christine McVie's voice where Christine yeah. comes in the, the, the second, harmony and the, the second, second verse. Yeah. 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 And, you know, when Stevie does this live in her solo tours, when she has her girls, I love Sharon and Lori. But that part is, that's Christine's harmony. Like, Christine and Stevie do tap into a witchiness that's so... This song just has a feel of, like, inky, dark water. And I just love it. And it's interesting, on Trouble and Shangri-La, I feel like on Planets of the Universe, they, they were trying to go for a Rhiannon feel on that opening guitar. But there's nothing like the original, baby. <laughs> Or I, even Planets of the Universe, some people said it sounded similar at the beginning. Oh, that's right what there. I meant. That's what I meant okay. to say. Oh. All right, what does everyone else have to say about Rihanna before we give Jim uh, his next uh, segment? <laughs> Nathan, I know you have an opinion. Um, I like the guitar fills on this one. The little things that come in, everybody knows what I saw. Oh, that's yeah. just... I can't explain how good that is. Those, so those, good. those always just sound pretty cool to me for some reason. It, it, so that's it, all I have. Great band, great band ideas came in there. Uh, something for, I don't know if it's like Mick and John probably had some input and Christine might have had some input, especially the, the piano stuff. Lindsay must have had some Because the Buckham mix version is kind of like pedestrian, kind of straight ahead. This yeah, song, that rhythm section. I mean, the Mick Fleetwood, John McVie rhythm section, it just shows their magic here. And then... Yeah. I feel like Christine's piano part does kind of have that blues feel that Christine brought. You know, she comes from a blues background, so there's definitely yeah. I mean, what is it, a Fender Road she's playing or a electric piano? It's fucking amazing. I always love the bass. And oh, that first twenty seconds, the bass with the regular guitar, how it interplays. So, Alicia, I mean, obviously you knew Rhiannon before you yeah. went to this <laughs> album, but what are your thoughts on Rhiannon? Well, it, it's the, the song that made me go do right into Stevie Land, but... Um, and you always talk about Stevie kind of having a gothic feel. This is like the this is the granddaddy of all that, right? Or grandmother or whatever yes. you want to say. <laughs> yes. Um, it, me picking up this record uh, the last couple of weeks, it was just weird to hear, again, this song in the four and a half minute version. I'm so used to hearing... In the Stevie realm, the all these live versions that are six, at seven, at ten minutes long. So it was just interesting again to hear it in its very condensed, precise 
And that seems to always be a problem for Stevie when she gets into the realm of Fleetwood Mac. She... <laughs> Who's what? Well, she likes... I call them epic songs, but they're like the Stairway to Heavens and the November Rain. She lives there. And right. really... Show them the way. Just well, she doesn't, she doesn't. She doesn't, she doesn't. I mean, you know, that's all right. It's not an epic song. No, but... It's one that fits nicely in the body of work, just like uh, Blue Letter does. I think that's you're saying cool. you're used to Rhiannon being more of an epic from the live version, so you're oh, surprised yeah. by the compactness of the original... Yeah, again, it, it's, um, I've heard this, but it's just, I'm so used to live versions that when you go back, you're like, okay, where's that one in a million years line? Oh, uh, <laughs> it, it's just, <laughs> this whole album feels like that for me. Yeah. I actually enjoy Rhiannon as a compact radio cut, though. This version definitely has its time and place for me. I think I love the live versions that expand on it. I think it works as a three or four minute pop song too. Just fine. What do you guys think? I, th I think the live version blows it away on the 1980 live album with the sure. long, long instrumental part. Yeah. I love I mean, having yeah, both. You know, I, like the, I like the original version, of course, but the, the live version, especially in the 70s, I mean, you know, she was at the height of her powers. But I don't think they could have duplicated that energy in a studio version. So I think they were wise to make the studio version more radio friendly and then save the save the wildness for the live that's part of it it's part of the whole thing is 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 like understanding and maybe you can figure it <laughs> out and and you have to go see them live to to even right. have a chance at that you know or understand have a good recordings of it and, and that's part of the whole thing it's exactly that right there yeah. and they expound on it in person it's mm -hmm. part of the yeah you hit the nail on the head because i think you know food neck were a huge top 10 band and the general public all knew this version of Rhiannon, but like when we went to the concert, we knew the, the words to the live version. And I think creating that dual <laughs> universe really created a special fan base that was loyal. Like we were in on it, just like Nathan said. And mm -hmm. gives you an in. Yep. It's, sure. it's like a secret little decoder thing, right? I mean, isn't that part of it, Jim? What? Okay. Isn't, <laughs> isn't that part of it? I think, and Nathan, I think this started a lot of like being in on it because there's a lot of things TV would do okay. live or in different versions that you had to be in on it like what are some other examples oh like, like the back. opening of Rihanna and you know the uh, uh, you know don't change and don't leave me all that kind of stuff you know we know we know what uh, that is and like when you think of stand back like the general public knows stand back but to us stand back could never exist without you could be standing in it like it's such a part of like the Stevie universe yeah. okay. for the end. next level. Like there's all the, there's, I think we could sit here and brainstorm many <laughs> things. Um, but I think this is the first one where Stevie had the single version and then the expanded version that was for the fans. It's you know? well, that's why they've been around for so long because their music is breathing and growing and changing. Yeah. All right, Jim, let's return the floor to you for page two of the notes, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Well, it's going to be hard okay. to wrap up, Rhiannon. Okay, um, go ahead. I'm going to put myself on mute. Yes. Um, for me, this is the third single I heard. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the third single, uh, you know, uh, Over My Head and Say You Love Me, and I kind of got – I really liked that. I mean, I mean, liked it to, like, feeling that, well, this is my band, you know, and uh, – <laughs> and uh you still hear me yeah. yes everything went yes quiet. sir um okay there was two songs i really liked and i was used to this real smooth uh a mature woman singing i really like her cleverness and and her just a, just a good uh, song craft and everything and then everybody leave <laughs> Go, oh, we're listening. Oh, the, the floor is yours, Jim. This is the, okay. the okay. this is all you. Okay. And uh I mean I'm happy to interject if you want my big mouth, but let's this not is, this is wild. This is a great story. Um you know, uh, I was and then the, I heard the DJ, he was 
he said, well, a new Fleetwood Mac song was going to come on. I said, oh, great. I'm going to get to hear this, this woman singer, this mature, writes great songs. There's a piano player. I'd love it, love it, love it, love it. And, <laughs> and, uh, um, let's see where, <laughs> and then what, <laughs> yeah, and then what happened? Well, I'm, I'm finding my, I'm voice. on the edge of my seat, Jim. Yeah, I know it. Um, Okay. And love it, love it, love it, love it. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know. Mature uh, woman. If you're a big Christine fan, and I am, and, uh, mm -hmm. okay, this new song started playing, and, well, this is a different singer. And I knew, and I thought, is this Fleetwood Mac, or, or they made a mistake when they, you know, when they started playing music? But I, I was listening to the, the bands. Well, that, that's them. Because that's kind of what they are, you know, just a, a kind of really an organic kind of sound to them. And uh, and then when Stevie started singing, uh, oh, geez, where did I mark that? You know, the music, and I said the music was different, but it was the same sound. It, it's yeah, okay, as the. Okay, and when uh, and when then when Stevie started saying, uh, "All your life, you've never seen a woman take by the wind." I thought that uh, that voice was really harsh. You know, it was just like, man, I wanted to, I wanted to hear the other singer. You know, <laughs> really, for real, <laughs> I wanted I wanted to hear the smooth, golden throated, you know, <laughs> Christine would be, <laughs> and. And uh, I heard that, brother. I heard that. I was taken back by her, her harshness in her voice, and I just didn't like her singing compared to that other other singer. But you know, the song kept playing, and I, I listened to it. You know, I said, "Okay, I'll, I'll give it a chance." And I had at the end is when it when it was over. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, this has got kind of a drive to it. it it's <laughs> It just kind of has this thing to it that mm -hmm. man, kind of, but, uh, it's a different kind of thing like rock and roll. It's like something I never heard in a long time. Maybe it was like what Janice did. I don't know. But uh, okay. And then as Rih Rihanna played more and more on the radio, I started really liking it. I mean, just and just like you know, like like the third time you heard Edge of Seventeen or something like that, you just wow. You know, this is great. It's it's you kind of understand the words. You start pick through it, and uh, you know you really start like. And then I must have been on the bus that morning. My uncle was a bus driver, and he played rock and roll. And awesome, that's cool. Came on, Rhiannon must have came on because for like the first three classes, Rhiannon was going in my head over and over and over, and I said, <laughs> you know, just wow, it's like, and I think I was picking, I was trying to, I think I was picking meaning because I was uh, of the of the words and how they related to each other because this is a really, it's a it's a poem or just a real uh, advanced writing. It's really good. And, uh, but then I thought, well, this is just getting like it's overtaking me. It's like, this is just like consuming me. It's just, it's just something, you know, just the, the spirit, spirit of Rhiannon took your body over. It, he's been well, taken by the wind, Jeremy. Taken, he was by, taken by, the, by the wind. Wind. Not in a million years. Not, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I did something kind of weird and mentally it's like, well, you know, you can be kind of led, led in a certain way by, you know, fancy music or, or just, you know, and, and you can kind of be led in the wrong direction because of, of, you know, but what I did mentally is I took her voice away. I just like put everything aside, the band, which was great. Just loved that. The Brianna musically mm -hmm. and voice. I said, I'm putting that aside. 
and her writing, which I've just amazed, just the theme of it, like a cat in the dark, and then she's the darkness. That's just just beautiful poetry and and the empowerment of women being strong or or or, or living your dreams. And I, I took that and, and it was just kind of like, I was just left with this, what I can envision what this person is, kind of a young adult woman, kind of a, a dreamer, kind of a little strange, little, and I kind of, it's kind of like, she, I don't know, like floated down or, or I just brought her down at my level or something. And I and she sort of kind of ended up instead, and she wasn't like necessarily f- from an, uh, uh, like a, like a, uh, something that was totally. an in- outside. It was something that was within me or even behind me. I, I can only put it in those words. It's something like this, you know, within or even behind. I'm a, and I, and I thought, well, okay, you know, it's kind of like, well, she is someone that you can trust or like believe in or or admire or something. And it's kind of like, well, you know, it's like the great women in my family at that time. It's it's kind of like she kind of compares or just something about her. It's kind of like all the aunts and grandmas and moms and everything. It's. It was just something that I had to. I had to put it in a box, or or, or put it in a car, 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 uh, car panel, put it in a compartment, and uh, and it was, and then it was that for for that, and then later. Um, Jim, I'm gonna give you about a one minute warning. Before we move yeah. on, <laughs> that's why I keep things rolling. But I want you to get your whole okay. parter in there. Yes, I'm. I'm pretty a, a much of a cynical, wary person of outside influence. But this is kind of like something that was like so familiar inside, or just like you know, um, and uh, then uh, okay, I went through everything else. Okay, then I started hearing, you know, I, I, okay, I, I was, I took that to heart and I kind of explained it that why not, why do I like this so much and why is it just amazing to me? And it's just like this person, it was kind of, I took it down to a person level, like she, even just the, the words, just put the word of just her spirit or or, or, or whatever. And I, I just put, the, okay. And then, I was, you know, when when the other Fleetwood Mac songs would come on the radio or, or we're Christine, it's almost like I'm with this, you know, this section of the band. I'm I'm with this, and and I knew, and I'll explain later on on the other two uh, singles that came out that uh, I really liked that, and I felt that this was my band, and and it's almost like. I was waving them goodbye. I said, you guys are great. You're terrific. And it's just like, I'm, am I this, this other singer is, I prefer her. So basically his, once you go Nix, you never go back. That doesn't well, rhyme. I mean, and, and, and Chris is terrific. And, and, and I, at the end here, I said, well, I found my champion. I'm sorry. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it, everything rode on it for the rest of the band, for one person to like that as, that sphere of the band. And I'm, I just, you know, I'm just with this new little weird sounding girl with young adults. And, and then, you know, and that was, like that was when it came out and I never really knew who this person was till about eight years later. When you went to the record store, right? The, the record well, you saw the poster and, and TV, oh, and that's TV. Right. 
back. I was just watching it. I was watching Prince. Not Prince 1999 came on and things like that. I thought that was the coolest shit in the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, I saw this uh, woman and I could tell that she was like a mature woman on stand back. And it's like I was watching it and it just popped in my head. That's Fleetwood Mac. And, and you know, I wasn't really t- entirely sure. But that's her, her hair's not clean. It's like I may have seen pictures and stuff, but her hair wasn't like Fleetwood Mac or, or where she dressed, but that was that voice. And, you know, there we go. So that well, was Jim, that was a very, 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 very heartfelt. I mean, that's happened. I mean, it's crazy. But it's amazing. It's like you like you're a jazz guy. I mean, that's an example. And then you went to country or something. <laughs> it's the well, same you, thing. You saw you the like, light, Jim. You saw the light. You like woman, you go to men. You know what I mean? You just go for... <laughs> okay. I mean, but, I mean, I was listening to this record all week, and, and I love all four of Chris's songs. are terrific. Yeah. And, and this, there's, I still have that, wow, she's for real. I mean, the, the, the songs are so real. So can we say in conclusion, before we move on, that Stevie Nicks changed your life right when well, you heard her? Yeah, but it's funny that uh, I didn't, I was waiting for kind of like them to be explained in the media or something, Fleetwood right. Mac, really get into it. Because why, why go out and buy music or get really intense with something that you don't really see every day? Right. I went to the Denver Broncos instead. Because they were on the TV every Sunday. I got you. All right. Okay. Jim's two-part epic of Rhiannon is now immortalized on Phonogenics 101. I love it. Okay. I mean... That's so cool. That's, you, were that's there, you were there when Rhiannon came out. The DJ... Uh, it, Rhiannon came out in the spring of 76. Like, in, I remember that there was no leaves on the trees and... and you know, at school, I may have been riding on the bus when I that revelation of this woman came. You know, or I was walking on the uh, on the sidewalk around the school. It just. And how old would you have been when this all happened? It's thirteen, thirteen, fourteen. Oh, I love it, and you were so impressionable at that age. So for Stevie Nicks to come along, well, yeah. I'm just, uh, just I, enough to start liking. I had I had the way. <laughs> Girl voices on the radio. <laughs> great, great. I, I, I've heard a lot of great songs over the years, even before that and since. It's like, why buy a song or buy some music when you get tired of it? This is different. I never got tired of it. She only got tired during her later versions, but we won't talk about that anymore. All right, okay. any other thoughts on Rhiannon? Is that, well, yeah. Thanks to Stevie Nicks, there are thousands and thousands of young girls or even older girls and women out there named Rihanna and thanks to her. Yeah. 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 One of them slashed my tires in, uh, at a club. Oh, and then, that's not a nice Rihanna. That's not a nice Rihanna. <laughs> her boyfriend did. Okay. Uh, so, Rihanna, thumbs up. Oh, God. I can't. There's no way. Did I miss anybody? Did anyone have any I thoughts? Don't... I don't have that many thumbs. All right. So moving on, as in the words of Jim, we're moving on to one of the singles by the mature-voiced woman yeah. that we know is Christy McVie. Now, I'm not a huge listener of the expanded edition. Like, I always buy them and I like them. But I do have to say, the demo version of Over My Head has the original Christy McVie, like, classic piano track. That they took out of the album version. Which one? I love it because it reminds me of like something that would be off mystery to me or uh, heroes are hard to find. So hearing over my head with the acoustic piano and the verses just like gave me the biggest life ever. But they took it out of the the classic mix. Um, thoughts on over my head, oh. Jim, and then Roland. Hey. Yes, uh, this is one of those things with the radio. Radio, radio was on. And uh, it was a real slow little, you can barely hear the instruments coming on. And it got, and it picked up and got stronger and stronger. I don't know, it was the first time I heard this. And then I heard this, you know, woman singer and, and with some kind of odd lyrics. 
But when she went, uh, let's see. Uh, well, when, when Christine said, your, when she went with a hard vocal, your mood is like a circus wheel. And I think I was, I was in the basement and the radio was on. And I think I was walking up the steps, like the third or fourth step. It's weird. It's just I have this memory. And it's almost like she was directing that angst against me. It's like you don't hear this on pop radio, a kind of a vocal like that. It's almost like, well, is she talking to me? <laughs> it's crazy. I think that personal connection that everyone feels with Fleetwood Mac is why they've I mean, endured. And, you know, uh, I just love it. Just it. Um, so I think we can all safely say that there's times when we felt like they're singing this, this only about me. Like they only understand me like no one else can. Yes. <laughs> and the intro kind of reminds me of like the sun rising, that the really slow intro, the day is beginning. Fading. Yeah. The, and, I mean, it's, um, it's a very believable song. You know, it's about, I mean, oh, there's a story that, uh, I don't know, going around that, this is direct directed at Lindsay because they weren't getting on as kind of collaborating and working through songs. Yeah. And Lindsay kind of a hard ass, uh, you know, and, and it gets results though. That's right. And, you know, there was some mm -hmm. clashing. That's one of, you know, it's like always, tell that to my platinum record sales. I always, right? always my... thought, <laughs> <laughs> See, I feel like this one's got to be about John McVie. I feel like it's got to be about John. Yeah. I mean, I, I would think it's your mood. I mean, like she way they hit that vocal, you know, he was a drunk and kind of uh, a little bit of a bastard, you know. <laughs> large, you know, when he was doing that, he was a bad guy, and he's a sweet guy when he's not. So she had enough of it. So, um, let's see. <laughs> Roland, you had your hand up. Did you want to throw something in? I'm surprised this was the first single off the record because I thought oh. the, this is an okay song. It's not my favorite. Uh, I thought there were s other songs that were stronger that could have been a better first single, like Say You Love Me or Monday Morning or Rhiannon. Okay. I read that the band thought this was like the worst choice for a single. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a connection song. Especially women have been treated like crap, you know. See, I think it's a great radio hit. I think it's like made for the radio. I agree. It's very warm. It hangs right in there with like some uh, some summer breeze. You make me feel fine. That band. Yep. And little little Crosby, Stills, Nash, and whoever. You know, I mean, it really. I think it's got that same flavor too. I think it's very nineteen seventies radio friendly. Joni Mitchell was out with Help Me a, a, a little bit around this time, so there's definitely the the time for that. Uh, Alicia, did you know this song prior to this album? I'm sure you did. I think I've heard it, but I really listened to it here in the last couple of weeks. And it's it's a solid song. It just also reminds me why uh, Christine has a great voice, a great timbre of a voice. And then she turns around and she sings all these really bubblegum pop songs. Not all of them. I'm Warm ways, I wouldn't say, is bubblegum, but she does a lot of bubblegum pop, or what was considered bubblegum pop in the uh, I, I grew up in the late 90s, so we had a Okay, there's great, that era was great music. Yeah, but I, like I, I think of this like Olivia Newton-John, it, it's good, okay. but... Okay, I think, I, I beg to differ, so, because... Of the vocal, I would that. It, I think the instrumentation is really organic, very like you know, um, it's just very grounded you know, and earthy and organic. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like of uh, real. I think another it's, song that was out on the radio at the time, uh, I guess it was a couple years earlier though, was like Carly Simon haven't got time for the pain. I feel like that's the same oh. kind of. Radio Are you aesthetic. Us with Carly Simon. And I Tony love Carly. Singles. Big hit. Um, the one with Mick Jagger sings in it. Um, <laughs> shit. You're so mean. Oh, you're, that is <laughs> not. It, that hasn't dated a, n not one bit. 
But do you think all these songs had that mid seventies radio sheen? Yes, with an organic, not not a sheen as much as an organic sure. of no, characteristic about them. You're no good, Linda Ronstadt. Yeah, organic. Yeah, kind of. Not in the same way that "Over My Head" and "Summer Breeze." You make me feel fine are organic, but a right. similar organicness. That was a good comparison. Summer Breeze. Summer Breeze. I guess I never thought of Christina's bubblegum as more just radio friendly, I guess. Like 70s well, you radio. You could call friendly. it radio friendly. To me, it's like the 70s version of bubblegum pop. There's, it, it's got good lyrics, but there, I, I feel like it's really light and airy and it's very fluffy. And when you it, really listen to the lyrics, you go, holy smoke, she's actually. Dark. It's, it's a dark. sad song. Yeah. But I wouldn't say there's a lot going on musically. Um, so it, it, it's a decent well, somebody's not it works Buckingham. for the radio, but I don't know. Not somebody's not a Lindsay know. Buckingham fan because there's a lot going on there. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's completely accurate or not, but, uh, do you think Fleetwood Mac would have had the commercial appeal and reach without the more radio friendly McVee songs to kind of blaze the trail? No, I don't feel like no. over your, over my head made its way for Rhiannon. People want to party and dance, and people used to dance in the seventies. And I've I've heard it. Like my grandma told me, she was like, "Well, we used to really dance a lot to that one song." And I was like, "You know, I was like, well, was it Go Your Own Way? No." And finally, of course, we landed on Dreams. People used to dance back then as a recreational sort of a thing, and so I think that yeah, "Say You Love Me" and uh, "Over My Head," you know, some of those are very seventies dancey with your caftan or whatever you're wearing <laughs> you see the picture of me in the caftan from this weekend what's that what's i wore a caftan on stage on sunday night that was the culture oh like, i wasn't really a part of it yeah I saw. you you'd have weekends and people will just throw on some vinyl and drink and and carry on and the best records were ones that made it you know and Fleetwood Mac, their older stuff, lend itself to the dancey, uh, you know, the Bob Welsh area. There, there's a lot of dancey, a lot of um, hmm. cool, cool sounding yeah. stuff. But not everybody is gothic and moody. You need something to counterbalance the. Yeah, the and, and Christine does that beautifully. It's yeah. just, not, not every yeah. song can be desperado. You also need some, yeah. you know, yes, to, but it's, it's, to make it easy. Not every song can be Wild Horses. You also need some satisfaction. I think that's why the Fleetwood Mac albums are so much more successful than Life. the TV solo albums, because we have that balance. Life in the and I did say at the beginning, this is a very strong record. They really do balance each other out, the three of them. They really, really do. Yeah. But th yeah. there's a reason... I'm not the hugest Christine fan. I see I've really stirred up everybody. And you, oh, no. Now you got it, man. No. There's no right or wrong opinion about music. But hey, this is I'm more of this way than that way. I'm just... So. We can all agree that Christine McVie's lyrics definitely don't have the depth of the Stevie Nicks song. This, kind of this is kind of what... Uh, Maybe at first glance. For Stevie and Lindsay were. They were like a working man. That was like a job. They didn't really care about fame. I mean, they just wanted to get, they wanted to go on the road and play. And, I mean, and be comfortable, go to Kiln House or whatever, Benefold or whatever they went to and yeah. record. And, and, you know, that was their, that was their existence. And then this came along. <laughs> I'm going to take back my statement because there's things on Christy McVie's In the Meantime album that I'm like, oh, they like ripped my heart out. That's okay. a good album. Oh. Good. I'm glad you took that back. I really yeah. good. I love, yeah. I love I like uh, I like that album too. Okay. Love, oh, go ahead, Jim. I love Call Calumny or Calumny or Oh Call yeah. I love every That's, song that I do. Well, I'm I'm tied to the mast and I think Stevie's got me tied to that mast. <laughs> okay, so let's try something fun. Alicia, don't put your rating till last, because I want to see what what you're gonna put compared to everyone else just for fun. Over my head. Thumbs up, medium, or down? Medium. Oh, we have medium in the bottom row. <laughs> I love it. Uh, oh. 
next, we have a song that was written by Stevie Nicks, but sung by Lindsey Buckingham until the Practical Magical soundtrack in the 90s when Stevie finally recorded a version with her doing the vocals. Uh, is this the only time that Lindsey ever sang a song that Stevie wrote, except maybe on the Buckingham Nicks album? Unfortunately. <laughs> Um, well, she's a great songwriter. She should have written more songs for the other two. Crystal they was all recorded on hers. She could write lyrics for them to sing. Crystal was <laughs> recorded three times. First on the Buckingham Nicks album in a different time signature. It had a different time signature. Then they did it on the Fleetwood Mac album, and then Stevie's solo version on Practical Magic. Is there a story why Lindsay's singing on this? On both, there's no real. It might I be never heard his voice work better with well, dude, he probably shamed her into it he was like there's too much of you on this album and you're too prominent and so you need to go be quiet for a while and i'll, I'll sing it it was probably like that type of a situation i don't know it's they they do they go duet through both you know these versions they they sing together so um well i was listening to like yesterday and i said i was listening and just you know just kind of open mind open and you can just yeah. tell about it you know it's her the way she writes all right roland you had your hand up uh i think this version is great Lindsay's voice is great i think this is better than the practical magic one where her voice is kind of harsh but i think that's because of time roland hmm. Lindsay's better on this one it's right. true that's true i think Lindsay's better on this one really harsh i'm sorry on, on practical magic do you always trust your first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Jim. Um, I think the Practical Magic version is the best version myself. I okay. Think. I, I think, like, yeah. Um, uh, I think Christine's playing on this sells it. It really makes it a lot better than Buckingham Nicks for yeah. playing. And, you know, the guys... Um, you know, uh, Mick and John, it's, it's, it takes it to a different, and really the, the Buckingham next version is really good. And this is just a different, it's uh, better. And both are great. Both of them are fine. All right. Now, Alicia, I feel like earlier you mentioned that you love crystal. What are your, th am I remembering correctly? Yeah. Um, Okay. The first version I heard was Stevie's from Practical Magic, and when I heard that one, I was just taken away with it. When I was yeah. listening to this oh. record for the first time, um, I was really surprised by this album version. I, I think it's kind of the highlight for me pulling through this record here in the last couple weeks. Um, I was surprised to find that it was Lindsay who did the lion's share of the singing, but he executes it very well. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it also surprised me that it was, I mean, Stevie does some of the lyrics, but I went, oh my goodness, this is a duet, really, kind of. Um, and then it made me think, how, besides the chain, did they really do duets in this group? And it made me realize they had the perfect setup to do a lot of duets. And I don't really remember them doing tons of duets. No, they didn't. Well, what goes? That's a country music thing. Good point. Um, duets is a country music thing. Rock and roll is a collaboration and harmonies and, you know, just kind of building on, building up, you know, just building a big old house musically. I feel like after I Don't Want to Know on Rumors, we never really heard Lindsay and Stevie sing like they did on Crystal or anything on these first couple albums. I really feel as though we've had three versions of this song. I think the fourth one should be live on the next tour. Wouldn't that be cool? This is one that people forget about when they're making their little wish lists. And I think this would be great as a. Steven's saying no. Steven's no. saying, why are you saying no, Steven? Because no. uh, of her boys. She doesn't. I would like to hear her sing it back when she wrote it, when Lindsay recorded the vocals. She could have knocked it out of the park, but her voice isn't there anymore to do that song. Thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. I did, uh, no, I did make fun of the Practical Magic version. I did, I did like that version. I did like it. I didn't think it was terrible. I did love, 
If you ever did believe, though. Oh, that's a great song. I love that song. I listened to that so many that's times. I still listen to that a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Christine's uh, keyboard solo at the end, I've actually kind of ripped that off a couple times in my own album. My own music, I kind of borrowed a little bit. And it doesn't make you think of rolling waves, you know, hitting the shore, hitting the sand. It doesn't evoke that. And those two voices together, there's nothing like it. Especially their younger voices together. I yeah. know I'm going to get crucified for that. And they did sound good later, but there's something about their tones right here that it's just like... Lindsay's vocal is extraordinary. And and Lindsay, I, Crystal. Who's? Lindsay had a hell of a voice back then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a different from... A lot of review guys say he has a boyish voice, and it's probably that's kind of what it is. Um, but... You know, Lindsay, Lindsay could have been went commercial with the soul stuff and been just as wealthy as anybody else, but that wasn't his bag. That wasn't his thing. He wanted to be an artist and just go on and and you know spend weeks and weeks on one little part of his music. I know this is a topic for a different conversation, but I don't feel yeah. like the Lindsay Buckingham solo albums are nearly as weird as he thinks they are. Like I don't feel like they're that huge of a departure from what he did with Fleetwood. And I have all of them. I've played them, but I don't hear anything. I'm like, woo, he, maybe like go insane his like DW suite. But after that, like once yeah. you got into the 2000s, I didn't hear anything where I'm like, woo, he's really pushing the envelope on this one. Mm. Yeah. Oh. But, I mean, he's, he's not accessible. He doesn't want to be. <laughs> or he's just doing his, you know, but I feel like his lack of accessibility is more like his hooks aren't as strong on his solo albums. Not he's like doing these crazy sound collages that are so experimental. I feel like the hooks aren't as good, but I don't know. There goes the, all the thumbs down on my Facebook. Uh, Crystal, oh, he, he likes that simple rhyme pattern, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, baby, baby, there you baby. go. There you go. <laughs> Well, you know, if Jimmy Iovine was my producer, I could make a hot record too. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's <laughs> okay. It's kind, you know, okay. Well, maybe not, but you know, or Tom Petty. I mean, if you had all the Lindsey Buckingham does his own thing. But is it because it's because he has two? Well, okay, let's not go there. Who's buying the Belladonna Record Store Day double album? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're coming out with what, a what? two. <laughs> they're coming out with a two LP what? set of Belladonna for Record Store Day this year. Oh. Okay. oh, yeah, but that's just the regular record and, and the live one that's stuck on the CD. It's the same <laughs> okay. CD. It's some of the demos and stuff, too. Yeah, yeah they, which is on the well, Belladonna Deluxe one already. They came out on CD. Yeah. They need to take all these videos of Fleetwood Mac and Stevie and clean them up and crisp them up. You watch these old movies from the 70s, 60s, and they're like, you know, Blu ray quality somehow. I don't know if it's the way they were filmed, but. They need to work on this stuff. It's like an old VHS tape. See, I feel like that's part of the, char the charm for me, is it puts it in a time capsule. I was just Maybe thinking today that's what they Stevie don't should do with her themselves. fortune. Sorry, well, she's busy working on her Rhiannon TV series. Okay, Crystal. No, she should spend a chunk of change and have all those videos remastered and preserved, because they are really shoddy quality. It's yeah. part of rock history. And right, that's I was saying they don't own them. That's the thing. Like you know, oh, uh, Warner Brothers owns them, right? Everybody owns bits and pieces, so it's yeah. you know they gotta put it like the US Festival where they did uh, the 1982 concert. We've seen clips from various songs, but where's the rest of it? You know, I feel like the their five management teams can never get on the same page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean it's out there somewhere. Somebody has it. Okay, Crystal, thumbs up, thumbs down, or sideways? That's all right. Keep feeling like you're calling oh. out a person. Like, who's Crystal? Is there a person named Crystal on the panel? No, there's not. Nathan gives it Nathan, the sideways. Your, your arm is crooked. <laughs> no, I'm going sideways on this one. <laughs> All right, so we're going to flip over the record. <clears throat> I go thumbs up on the Enchanted version or the Best Buy version. <laughs> um, Sorry. Christine McVie is back. Well, is this going to be another heated controversial discussion <laughs> um, I don't know what song it is say you uh say you'll love me oh okay now before we even get going 
I just have to say that that version of Sable Love Me from the Dance is one of the limpest things I've ever heard in my life. What is she talking oh, about, Willis? That banjo, then it's like, oh, oh. So, la, I don't la, even la, hear John McVie singing, excuse me, so. That hasn't oh, happened before or since. You don't think, oh, I, was, I was waxing this, I was thinking about that, I was like, we haven't had that before or since. There's a reason John for that. John McVie singing, this is <laughs> it's so neat, and the ooh la las are Terrible. not to be missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's, they tried. It's cute. It's cute. They 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 uh, rearranged it and tried and I think it's pretty good. So this was the first song they played in the rehearsal space. The chorus yeah. came and they came into the three part harmony. Let's start with Alicia. I'm curious oh. of what you think of this Christy McVie track before we go into yeah. the other guys. This is probably my favorite song of hers off the record. Yeah. So. It, it's a really, really good song. It's a solid song. So, and I love her piano on it. I just think it has it has such a groovy feel. I can't think of a better, like a cooler word to say, but just freaking groovy. Very groovy. Yeah. It, when the loving starts and the lights go down. <laughs> that's <the> good. <laughs> you sound just like it. <laughs> we will be here until the sun comes. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> but this is like McVie at the height of her powers. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, it's got a hook. It's a if they ring. tour again, we're gonna have to have you off stage to like <laughs> sing those lines. <laughs> <laughs> do I mean do the Christine 2019 version? When love and starts and the lights. Oh, <laughs> <poor> baby. <laughs> Ouch. Next, I'm going to log in tomorrow. Why did I lose 50 subscribers? <laughs> I love Christy McVean. I love that she's back on stage. Yeah. Her vocals were not my favorite. I like Stevie's modern vocals a little bit better than Christine's modern vocals. Hmm. Say you'll love me. What does everyone have American. to say about this? Hey, my, my have mercy, baby. Oh, Jim. Yes, it's a. It's got a very. Uh, it's got a lot a a birds like instrumentation and feel to it. It's you know it's not stealing from the birds, but it has a lot of their elements. I think my I listened to this with my son, and the he was going to his uh, his college, and I said, I said birds, and there's one more birds, and then he said tambourine man. You know, it's like. He listens a lot. Of, he just he's got Spotify. He listens. He is God. He listens a lot. Of stuff. In. But uh, um, I in. A, yeah, um, it's got a real. It's a real. It's a great radio song. It's got this bouncy piano, and and again lyrically, it sounds kind of light, or you know, the, it's sung as a light, but there's a lot of darkness in there. I will say I did not love the single edit with the extra guitars. That was a little too cheesy for me. I like the album version. The trans at the end, the falling, 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 and the you know the harmonies on that. That's great. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love how so Stevie holds her note just a little longer than everybody else. Yeah, it's a good song. And then amazing. It's kind of steel. Like <laughs> the attention. <laughs> can, I, can I tell the funniest thing I've ever read on a CV message board? <laughs> This is all. This is off track, but can we go there? The okay. Tingle in the Night Please. live version of Everywhere, where uh, <laughs> she's like, "I want to be with you everywhere. I want to be with you." Like, yeah. <laughs> Somebody I wrote on a message it. board like Stevie. Stevie should have just gone on stage and hit a gong right in the middle of the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't you sing it that way every time you hear it, though? Yes. I, 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 it goes in my mind. I, I'm I thinking of Stevie when, yeah. I'm thinking you can't of un it's one of those things you can't unhear. Alicia, don't, if you don't know that, don't listen to it. Because you'll never unhear it, and everywhere will never be the same for you ever I'll again. Be with you. I'll be with you. Like, out of nowhere, there's no reason for it to be in there. But see, no, it's, like, it's oh. great. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and with their stupid, like, filmed after the fact close ups. <laughs> yeah. 
You okay, see Stevie smoking a cigarette before the song starts, and she's wearing a, what, a, a denim blue miniskirt, I think. Why can't you stop? Back to back to 1975. Back to 75. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Stevie definitely held the note just a tiny bit longer, though, and I think it works. Yeah. And fall and fall. It's so good, except in the dance version where I feel like it's limp. Yeah, it's the best uh, Christine song on the record. And uh, again, I'm surprised yeah. this wasn't her first single because it's it's a str the strongest single, I think. It, it was the strongest single, but it should have been the first single. Uh oh, Sugar Daddy might come and have a fist fight with you. <laughs> oh. Do you think Stevie's even singing on the on the dance version? I think she's just. I think her mic is shut off on that. I think it's not, her, her. It's not too. prominent. Let's put it that way. It's not no, it's it's everywhere like, on Tangle. I strain and strain and strain to hear. I can't hear. Fallen, right. fallen, fallen. And then she just <laughs> doubling Lindsay's melody. I feel like they're on the same note. Could be. <laughs> Question. Oh. Fleetwood Mac panel. Is the dance its own discussion or is it a side note, in your opinion? We've got to do the dance. Uh, it's, it's its own a, discussion. It's its own episode. Okay. It's We've been decided. Be. It's been decided. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts on Say You Love Me? We could do one just on Silver Springs, okay? Oh, you're right. How could uh -oh. that be a side note with Silver Springs? I'm going to write three pages. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Only one person on the panel is allowed to do a two to three page. Jim All got right, this Jim one. Can, Jim can have yeah. it. <laughs> Who calls? No, Steven, you get the dance one. Uh, I'll, I'll take the Tusk one. <laughs> well, Nathan, I guess you're stuck with Behind the Mask. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can make something out of it. Can... Okay, say you love me. Thumbs up, medium, or down. All right. Oh my! Oh my goodness, Nathan. It's just not my favorite. I don't, I'm not trying to be controversial. It's just not my favorite. I mean, I think it works in a lot of ways. You know, it's a nice upbeat song. You know what I think is interesting is the line about "There's not another living soul." Are there dead souls around? Are they like in a house full of ghosts? I think uh, that that's that line has always been one of the things, that, and that's one of my favorite things about about Fleetwood Mac and this whole body of musical work is is the supernatural element that yeah yeah Jim that kind of exists in it, and so that's why I like that. There's not another living soul because again, it's upbeat like we always love, you know, like that's all right. It's upbeat, but in fact, it's really sad. So it's kind of that a little bit. Because there's not another living soul around, but then also wasn't this written about? I don't want to talk about "Say You Love Me." It's such a boring, that's intimacy, right ass, trite sort of song. But wasn't it written about? Have that mercy, song? baby. John Mc, it would be hard to be John McVie and have to play bass on that, especially when you're all liquored up, like you know. Be a hard road. John McVie has hoed a hard road, and nobody gives him any. I don't see any TikToks about him. You know? <laughs> um. Stevie Nicks did say before she joined the band, she bought all their records and listened to them back to front. And she, she did hear a thread through them all. And I think it is that mystical supernatural thread. And let's not forget, I feel the Danny Kerwin, Bob Welsh albums, Future Games and Bear Trees have a lot of mysticism and like otherworldly ghosty kind of stuff in them, which I love, 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 love. Jim. I, while doing this, I kind of, well, I listened to this, of a few times and then i started i went back to that era the the welsh and uh kerwin era and there's some there's some good there's some good uh recorded stuff on youtube now from that era and bob welsh live was a killer yes he is a killer he sang pretty yeah. good well, i was, love he, bob welsh the shit is good all the way through there's all the, all those old ones are oh, they kind of dip as a as an like an act because some of their stuff, their, their albums were a little, a eh, little trippy, you know, they that trippy. But the live act, they were, they were pretty hard. Now I got to ask and no pressure at all, but Alicia, I hope you, I hope you stay with us through the Fleetwood Mac. Like later on when we go to like the earlier, cause there's some stuff to find. And I'd, I would almost like pay to hear what you think of all of it. Cause I love your fresh perspective. It's so interesting to me. Okay. Well, and now, the more I listen to this on the or album, because we're going to do rumors next. Right. That one, I, I definitely have heard. 
15 million times. Yeah. This one will be the one that gets played here another couple of weeks. And I really will have it more soaked than the it's, half a dozen, dozen times I've already listened to it. So it's going to stay with you. It's yeah. Alicia, have you ever watched that uh, YouTube thing where they're all like live in, is it Passaic? Is that how you say the name of that place in New Jersey? Passaic, yeah. New Jersey, something, something, 75, 82375. I think that's what it is. You ever watch that? That's good. That's good. Good show. Oh, you that's they, open with state? they were opening the tour with Station Man, which was an old. Okay, yeah. that's a cool oh, song. That's a good that's song. A good Fleetwood Mac yeah. song. Yeah. And it's good with Stevie Nicks on the harmony, too. Yeah. It's show well, that's it. why I was really wanting the deluxe, Jeremy, was just to have. I've understood that Buckingham is very much willing. He doesn't like to do a lot of covers of the right. old stuff. He wants to stick with his material. And I have to I have to admire that from an artist. But this album, and when they went on tour, he had to play those older songs because they oh. didn't have I, I mean I just thought of something. I do have to jump in. I totally lied to Alicia. There's something so essential on these deluxe editions that I totally forgot about till now. But the fucking live version of why with Stevie Nicks on the harmony oh, yeah. is yeah. one of the best yeah. Yeah. moments of all time in Fluid Mac. Yeah. It's a song that was originally a mystery to me, and they had like this two-minute guitar solo. But when they did it live with Buckingham and Nick singing that harmony at the end with McVie, I think that's her best song. One of her yeah, best I songs. Check that out. Oh my god. Here, you know, always do you gonna enjoy that, Steven. You like it. It's on the midnight special. Why Rhiannon and I think World Turning was the third one, right? So that was the midnight special, wasn't it? Maybe Why? I just don't know it by name. Yeah, the one she goes in, how can you love me? Why can't you just be strong? That one? Oh, yeah. when Stevie yeah. does the harmony, yeah. Jesus. Going through that. They put a knife through my heart. Ugh. Because I always loved it. I always loved that song as a Christine song from Mystery to Me. And I didn't hear the, the Stevie Lindsay version until these deluxe editions started coming out. Because I'm not a big YouTuber, so I don't really like search things out. But uh, ugh, put a knife in me. The well, CD one has it, it too. Up has, uh, here in the next uh, month or so. And I'll give you my opinion. That's it. Next go around. That's different. been reworked. That's been reworked. All right, we just had to pause because I didn't want to get a copyright infringement, but we had to watch the live thing, and I'd start uh, crying. I'd always make start crying. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's move on to this one's for you, Daddy. It's time for Landslide. Uh, <laughs> I think this is, was, we were recording when we talked about how Landslide in 1990 wasn't part of the Great American Songbook like it is now. Uh, at the time... Okay. When I bought this album, I'm like, oh, I, I forgot about this song. This is a cool song. But then Smashing Pumpkins covered it, and then the Dixie Chicks oh, covered it. Uh, the Dance released they released this as a single off The Dance, so it got a lot of play on VH1. It's and funny. now this is such a signature. The yeah. thing about Stevie Nicks is how many artists have that many signature songs like she does? Like She has a good four or five or six or seven. And most people oh, are no, lucky every, to every artist who can fill an arena the same size as Kelly Clarkson. I can. I don't think I can name seven signature Kelly Clarkson songs. Since you've been okay. gone, a moment right. like this. She had a great run. Katy Perry. Perry had a great run. <laughs> but I All feel right, like I'm Katy trying. Perry's. I feel like Katy Perry's hits. I love Katy Perry. Her hits aren't going to transcend to the next generation. I think they'll stay in a time and place. And the thing about Maybe. Stevie is she keeps every generation Maybe. keeps linking. Yeah, oh, yeah, their song in her catalog. Okay, oh, oh, yeah. like the kids these days aren't listening to California Girls. In my in my experience, because I you know I still go to the clubs. I feel like there's not that it hasn't carried over to the next generation. But I was just keeps, thinking about her show in her, her show in Vegas right now, her new residency. I I do love the person Kate I can think of is Celine. Celine, I think like some of her stuff will. I'm not. I hate Celine's music. Me too. I, think, I think it will carry through generations. I think she has some signature yes. songs. Like, like Heart Will Get that Hawker out before you record. This is Celine. This is Celine to me. She's always like, like being in the chest. Boom. No, but you were saying an artist that has four or five really signatures that if you were to ask a hundred people on the street, they could Lady probably Gaga. three or four. Yeah. Lady Gaga, I feel like her persona is bigger than her music catalog. I think that'll take some. Uh, well, uh, some people might have said that about, you know, Fleetwood Mac and 
Stevie in the day. You know, that'll work itself out. The, It'll and, be interesting to see about Lady Gaga because I feel like the new generation doesn't care about bad romance or poker face. Like it's not carrying over into the one next. One of my favorite things are the piano versions that she does of those of those things live. I have those. And I listen to them. You know, and uh, and so this isn't a an argument about Lady Gaga that we want to get into, but. I think that we'll see how that shakes out with time. A lot of people say might might have said, "Well, rumors are so poppy," and so you know, a lot of haters might it. have said that back then. But you, after the dance came out, I mean, remember? So that was a twenty year thing. So, so maybe we'll Gaga will have like her dance later. But What's to give a counter, to be argumentative with you, because I'm kind of in the mood to argue. Yeah. Whenever yeah. Lady Gaga is out her thing, and like, you know, her ass is and go sit at the fucking piano and put that acoustic version in the middle. Like, it's so predictable. She does it every time. We know it's coming. Like, she's going to show up in a uniform and have the dance tracks. Oh, surprise. She's at the piano doing the acoustic. Like, she always does it. Okay. Landslide. <laughs> I guess you're taking the last word on that one. <laughs> I like Lady Gaga. I love, I love Lady Gaga. Roland. Landslide. Okay, Landslide's really become her most famous song. And people who don't know Fleetwood Mac really or don't like Fleetwood Mac would know it's a Fleetwood Mac song. This is probably her most famous. I mean, you know, yes. people go to her, people go see Fleetwood Mac or Steve Nicks and they ball their eyes out when she sings Desperado. Last Night, you know? People use this as yep. in their yearbooks for high school. You know, this song has become the, you know, the great American um, song. Yeah, song. It's become part of it now. You know, and Cheryl Crow says something interesting. She says that, you know, I've written bunches of songs, but I've yet to write something like A Landslide. You can say that again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I love Cheryl Crow. Yeah. Pictures of landslide, even though. Cheryl Crow admits that you know she's not she's she for herself she has not read that peak yet where she's done the song that a hundred years from now will still be played on whatever whatever format we have in hundred years. I don't know though. I love me some soak up the sun. I'm not gonna lie. You know. Okay. Can I can I make an entry on? I'm sorry, Jeremy. I want to make an entry on landslide here, but you were saying something about no go uh, landslide. Stay on top. Keep put it back on topic. I'm a shitty host tonight. I keep uh, going off on these tangents. Landslide. Does anyone know the exact house in Aspen that that was written in? Oh, oh, you like to go to the houses. You like to find the houses. You know I do. I like to. I want to know which house it was written in. And there's this one interesting. I know we've all seen all the most uh, commonplace uh, VH1 specials and stuff like that. But there is this one, and I don't, I can't tell you what it's called where they they take the footage of her saying it was written in blah 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 and in this place in this house and they shoot and the b-roll footage that they shoot in this weird log house which isn't especially it's kind of dated looking and it's big and everything but it looks like it could plausibly be the house where it happened okay. i don't have any reason to think that it is the house but but anyway somebody knows where this house was and if it's not this tv extra special that I'm re referring to that I can see in my mind, then, you know, somebody else still knows. So uh, isn't the legend that Stevie Lindsay had a job in Aspen and Stevie kind of yeah. followed him out there. Was it with yeah. the Everly brothers? The Everly brothers. Yeah. yeah. And the, everybody went to a party and Stevie's like, I'm just going to stay at home and I'm just going to stay home and miss the party. And then didn't she write Rhiannon and landslide both. Right. The same night? At least landslide. Yeah, we gotta. I, I, we I, I, must find this house. We must that's find a, this house. Yeah. That's Thank good. you. Oh, there's a song right there. Could we all meet in Colorado and find the landslide house and then go to the Red Rocks Red thing Rocks. and wear big sunglasses walking in? <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll sh and then we we'll shoot our own fake close-ups of ourselves afterwards. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Please. Okay. Um. Roland's going to reshoot his close-ups, too. All right. To me, Landside is such a deep Shoot. song that... You know how there's things that there's so much you can say? For me, there's so much I could say about this that I almost have nothing to say. To be honest, I feel like the song speaks for itself. Yeah. I don't think there's anything I can say that's any deeper than the song. Landslide. Well, you have to love the solo in the middle of it, and sometimes it takes, like, five guitar players to make that thing happen live. <laughs> right, Jim? Unless Lindsay's doing it, right? Unless Lindsay... Right, Jim? Yeah. What do you guys uh, think of this album version? I think it's the least interesting version of Landslide. Really? Okay, yeah, I it prefer is. it live. Definitely. I think it comes to life. 
I like the live version and the studio both. Like I, I like the original because that's where it came from, but I think the live it's one of the cases where the live is just as good, maybe better. I love the version where she has her girls do a three part harmony with Lori and Sharon doing the harmony. I think it's beautiful. Jim. Yes, I like the one on David Letterman with Lindsay. That's a real good version. Great vibrato that night. <laughs> Two which nine, one, Dave Letterman? Which one? The David during Letterman. the dance promotion where she's got the red dress on. Oh I never yeah! Saw that. Oh yeah, brother. That's good. That's a great vocal. Yep. It's there was something very tender about the dance era. Like usually when bands reunite, it's kind of like a cash grab. But that to me, that felt pretty real. I know we're gonna be talking yeah, about it. Yeah. There was a lot of yeah, that was pretty real. Yeah, and they're still angsty. Like twenty years after the twenty three years after the dance, twenty five years. Um, you guys Alicia, like the, you have, the hip hop remix? Oh, I did have the I did have the landslide maxi single. I love that remix. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> Seemed like it would be good. Is it good? Yeah, it is. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hold up, but it's yeah. great. <laughs> Alicia, what are your thoughts on landslide? Well, I mean. I know more of the studio version just because it was on the greatest yeah. hits records. And of course, Stevie played it live, but her live version oh, from her albums, it's good, but I always preferred the, uh, her and Lindsay performing it. There's Me something, too. there's something there. That's um, a magic. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, at least for me, hearing you guys talk, how this song wasn't a hit or a, a perennial, a legendary song um, for many, many years. And mm -hmm. it's, I was almost wondering how, I say, how did it happen? I mean, it, organically? I mean, if they didn't release it as a single, was it just her performing it? But then well, I was seen it where okay. she did it live during the 70s Which, or 80s it was released as a single from the dance so when it was released as a single from the dance okay, it got so a lot of air really yeah, but how did that come about just by word of mouth just by people saying to other people this oh, is really it struck a chord that would she had, that, that would say about i'm growing older too yeah it struck a chord. dance reunion yes that's what made that's that really made the song resonate and yeah, then I'm the sorry. Dixie Chicks did their version a couple years after that and it was a huge hit so that's that's how the ball started getting rolling on that one yeah. Okay. I do remember the Dixie Chicks recording it. But, but Alicia, well, is what you were just getting at just how did that come about in the first place? Was it just people talking to other people to say, like, have you heard of this song called Landslide type of a thing? And that's what kind of dug well, it out of the grave? Well, it's one of those things oh, where yes, me asking that question is kind of a... Um, <laughs> Stevie's got a lot of good material. It's almost like she went back and fished this out and said, okay, let's do this. I believe in this song and it's going to be, it's almost like they did it with the same thing with Silver Springs. It's like they fished they did the exact out. same thing. Yeah. I think it was yeah. MTV. I think it's Fleetwood Mac's version of Desperado. It's yeah, the VH1 very, special. It was definitely the VH1 special, I think. It's interesting that they chose this. It's like, how? What made them? Why not Crystal? I mean, what? Why not? Sure. You know, Good. what made them pull this out? You know, I've. You know, what about? Um, I'm thinking Tusk. Um, Beautiful child. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, why not that song? I mean, I'm not saying anything bad. It's just interesting. Of how did they choose this? How did um, I think it's just one of those right place, yeah, right time, right moment. Tim, did you have something? Yes, it's there's kind of a two pronged thing with this because it was a favorite. You know, there was a live version on their live album that that like after Tess they did that live album. It's on there. It's in there's it, such a weird key on that live album. It, and oh, it's the best. And she's whispering the words too. It had an underground fan. The fans. The, you know, the concert goers and people that have the records, um, they, they, I mean, it was one of their favorites and it was underground, but it, I think that when the Smashing Pumpkins brought it to a different audience, 
that kind of in the Dixie chicks and then the stance, it kind of, it built it up. But in Stevie herself doing shows with it as a solo and then with Fleetwood Mac, and that's, you know, it's very powerful, especially when she's getting older and older and older. And, and it's, you know what? I think Stevie had to age into the song. I think her yeah, singing it as went, an older woman. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. that's what made it so salient at that time. Absolutely. Like I think it meant diff something different coming from her as a thirty-year-old as it did in a, a fifty-year-old, and it really resonated yeah. with people. So kind of like both sides now for Joni. Yes. Yep. Yep. I love that older version of both sides now, and then a little more obscure, but uh, Marianne Faithful's older version of "As Tears Go By" that she did on her Strange Weather album is just beautiful. Revisiting that old song, Earth. All right. Well, any thought, Jim? Uh, even South Park used it. So oh. it's part on. I have another it. thought, Jim. Nathan. <laughs> Me? Yeah. I did do it then. Okay. Um, just that this is one of those songs that uh, it's like Desperado because it gets people who don't like Fleetwood Mac. You know what I mean? It's one of those universal sort of songs. Like it's chain or Hotel California or it's kind of white two hundred other pop rock songs that are in the main catalog of you get the idea. Running on empty so one. And it's because of all that imagery, I think in particular it's yeah. about, you know, the snow covered hills and no matter where you are in America. Hmm, and let me add something to it. Hills. Not only did Stevie have to age into her song, but I think the fan base aged into the song. Because by the time the song came back in 90, we were all older and feeling something that we didn't feel the first time we heard the song. Like, this song didn't hit me as a 13-year-old the way it did as a 20, 30-year-old, 40-year-old. So I think Stevie <laughs> grew into the song, and I think the fan base... was a very sensitive teenager. <laughs> well, when I was a teenager, I was crying along to uh, freaking dreams. <laughs> <laughs> wild heart, wild heart, more accurately. Right. You know, I felt wild heart as a 17 year old, but I didn't quite feel landslide until I got a little bit older, the way I feel it now. Sure. So I think, I think the fan base aged into the song. What an interesting discussion because I never really thought about it. Jim. Yeah. When I first heard it, you know, I got it like in 83 and I never heard it before. And I said, Hey, just that's pretty. It's nice. It's guitar and Stevie singing about, you know, growing older and uh and, and enduring and uh it reminded me of hearts uh, dog and butterfly from like the first listen it's like you know a very stripped down acoustic thing that has a lot of open spaces totally. um and uh i was it should have been it should have been on the radio at release i mean this is you know, uh, certain formats could have played this. It could have been a two in the morning song, or you know, certain times of the day, afternoons is a good time for certain songs. This would have found. I think this would have been a good place. It could have been, I think, a late in the day type song. Do they play Desperado on the radio like that? I guess. I mean, they play it on um, glass rock stations. Yeah, I just don't feel the world was ready for landslide in '75. I think really? everyone. I think everyone was ready for Say say You'll Love Me and Over My Head. Okay. I think Landside's yeah. place came later. Just like Silver Springs came later. I think local bars keep these songs alive, too. Like, they play, like, local bands, they play Landslide and Desperado. So it, it's Brown hard. Andrew. It's yeah. probably <laughs> easy to play. It's a, it's, I'm not knocking it. It's very simple. Mm. Um, you're, uh, you know, just a, uh, not a very good guitar player or even it's because there's a lot of motion in it. You, you, you anyone that has a heart uh, picks up on this. And if you're a musician and you're starting out and you're just going out there and, and playing a little bit, I mean, it, it just, it just spreads around to the, you know, the artist community. Um, that's why a bunch of people picked up on it and did different version. It, uh, it resonated. You know what? I'm going to make another controversial statement. I think Stevie's voice aged into the song because the way she hit that note wasn't as powerful with her younger voice as it was with her little bit huskier, older voice. To have that age and wisdom in that high note that she milks every second of it in the concert yeah. is a, a signature moment that didn't work quite as well when she was young. Do you all kind of agree? Yeah. 
So that yes. Yeah. And it still sounds pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think this it's what she wanted to replicate with Lady and didn't quite yeah. hit the mark. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. All right. Are we done with landslide? Uh, thumbs up, everybody. There can't be any oh, sideways with iconic. landslide, is it? Oh, you had me worried, Nathan. I would have just hit leave meeting if anyone gave landslide a <laughs> sideways. <laughs> okay, up next. We hear the guitar fading in. <laughs> Lindsay comes in. Christine comes in sounding like Lindsay. You kind of can't tell that they're different people. Let's you really listen. Secondhand news. Everybody's mm. trying to say I'm wrong. I just want to be back where I belong. Okay. <laughs> World turning. What the first appearance of Buckingham McVie. Go away. Many years <laughs> later, would record an album together. Um, this is a little bit more of this. This album's full of really tight radio songs. This is the first time when it kind of spreads out and gets a little jammier. So, but, uh, Jim. Uh, well, let's continue. Uh, I was, I was going to ask after this, I like to switch. Uh, we can uh, cut it for a bit. I got to reboot with my phone instead of my iPad. My iPad's about dead. Yeah, we can take a break. I need, I need an intermission, Jim. Okay. Yeah, take a break right now. We'll take a Everybody is trying to say I'm wrong. <laughs> Chrissy McVie and Lindsey Buckingham. World turning. They're jamming. Uh, is this the only song they've ever written together until Buckingham McVie? Buckingham okay, McVie. Uh, yeah. So it's a rare collaboration. Um, like we were saying earlier, the song is a little bit more jammy than the rest of the album. But I think it's the perfect follow-up to Landside. I always love this song. It's a, it's, it, it cooks. It's a cooker. I don't know. What do you all think of this one? Great. If that late seventies era live, it was it smoking. Lindsay playing that real high, loud guitar on it live. Shoot, that's just. Wasn't that, there a song on Buckingham Knicks that kind of sounded kind of like World Turning? Like did well, was the world coming to? I mean, they're related in terms of the title, but <laughs> not really different. What, what other song? Is there one that has the same chord progression? I think this song rocks. No, to Jim's point. Jim, I agree. This song rocks hardcore. Yes, it's yes. great. Yes. It's funny. It, like the guitar echo on the arena, whatever place they are, that's, that's some great stuff. There's a, there's a Heim, a Heim video where, uh, what's it, Danielle, she's playing. And there's really no one there. And there's some kind of a guitar echo. She's a great player. And and it's kind of like uh World Turn and where she plays a good solo at the end. And Danielle? When, who? When Danielle. Danielle. Hi. Hi. They're, they're guitarists. Oh yeah, yeah. All the Heim ladies, yeah. Okay, okay. And now, the, I remember the youngest one did a movie. It is in a movie and the licorice pizza. Is that good? I haven't seen it yet, so... You got the uh, reviews. I saw them girls live. They were amazing. They put on the best show. I almost They're got a drumstick. She threw one out in the audience. I almost caught it. I went down, I touched it, and then some. I fought somebody for, for it, but I let them win. <laughs> I love it. They're great. They have some really good yeah. songs. I have their first... I know Stevie's a fan, but I've never delved into their music. But I do remember, back to World Turning, that yeah. they had done this song on the tour when Christine had retired... And Stevie had taken over Christine's parts. And I don't know what melody she was singing. I, whenever they did it live, I'm like, that's not... I don't think you're hitting the notes, Stevie. I don't <laughs> yeah. She was doing something a little bit different. Than you don't only say it once. <laughs> this, this song works great live, except for when Mick Fleetwood does his drumming. Oh, the, the drumming for like 20 no, minutes. No, no, you know, no. that, that's, I mean, I don't go for beer or go to the bathroom during a concert, but I would during this. Someone keep the electronic chest drum pad away from Mick Fleetwood. You know, it is interesting for five minutes, but not for 20 minutes. Well, that's what not like four two how long it takes to go to the bathroom and get a beer. So no one says yeah, thank yeah. you or anything. Yeah. You know, everybody just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like it either. <laughs> does anybody in the world like it besides Mick Fleetwood? No. Like any, is there anybody out there that's like, God, I can't wait till Mick's 
pounding his chest with the electronic. Yeah, that's why I paid my hundred dollar, one hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> ticket to see. I'll let that <laughs> I just leave right after that. But I'll pay an extra hundred dollars to take that out of the set. Like I would. I'd make take a. Here, put put some money towards the chowder at Fleetwood's restaurant. Keep keep the drum solo out of yeah, world yeah. turning. That, <laughs> I'll eat a second bowl of chowder, second ten dollar bowl of chowder. Yeah, <laughs> at Fleetwood's. <laughs> okay. Um, would I you think- rather go to Fleetwood's though? And this is a question I really have for everybody. Would you rather go to Fleetwood's and pay for a fifty dollar bowl of chowder, or would you rather go to that restaurant that Stevie and Sharon met at? The Blue Loon or whatever that place is called. Oh, the Blue Max. Or the Mexican, Blue or the Max. Mexican restaurant. Which is Carmen's, which is Carmen's in L.A. And I know we have people in L.A. here, Dr. Larner. And so has anybody ever been to Carmen's in L.A.? Was that the or Mexican Mark restaurant? Where they met? That's the one. Huh. We need to go there. We need to meet there and do a podcast from the table. <laughs> Come on. Somebody probably knows. Well, they probably just make it up. You go in and you're like, what table? I'll order out. Let's Uber something. <laughs> so, I love how Christine and Lindsay's voice sounds so similar when they sing together. Are they? That's, I don't even know if similar, but there's a blend. Like even when they yeah, did "Don't blend. Stop" together. Yes, you can't. Amazing. Uh, Stevie was awful when she did "Don't Stop" when Christine left, but she took over Christine's voice for that song too. "Don't Stop." And it was oh terrible. yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's shouting out the lyrics. And it wasn't like the melody. I felt like she had created a different, totally different melody. Yeah. Mm. I, thought it could... rock. I thought it was totally rock and roll, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must have been a few beers in at the concert. <laughs> <laughs> that you got during a uh, make doing this during World's World Tour- World Tournament. Yeah. Now, when Christine came back to Fleetwoods, or keep talking about Fleetwoods restaurant, and did her, that was her return to the stage is when she sang Don't Stop It, that blues fest, right? The first time like, she got on yeah, the plane yeah, went back yeah. to Hawaii. I, I oh. cried and cried when I watched that. Having mm. Mick V back on the stage. My girl, the songbird. Mm. All right, do you have any other thoughts on World Turning? There's not tons to say about this song. Alisa, what did you think of it? Because I'm sure you hadn't heard it before this album. And then, Jim, you're next. Yeah. Well, I love it. I mean, it's a great... It, it's like Blue Letter. It helps keep, keep the beat. I mm-hmm. remember it. I was telling Jeremy during break, I really listened to this record in the car and then I've had it on my phone. And this is that song where you're like, okay. And it picks everything up and it makes you go, all right, as you're driving down the road. I mean, it's a great song. It's fun. It's, you know, it's a dance song. Yeah. Oh, it's a barn burner. Okay. Jim, then Roland. Yes, uh, it's a it's a good jam, and like you said, uh, Lindsay and Christine, the bland, the harmonies, and and going back and forth from each other, it, they fit their voices together very well, and and you know just Lindsay singing a blues you know vocal was doing very good doing it, mm-hmm. and you know once again some Af- African rhythms in it, and. Uh, um okay that's my take on that i do feel when it starts to meander they fade it out too like they don't keep it what just when it starts to get like enough's enough they know when to start fading which yeah, i think is yeah yeah perfect roland oh I'll, I'll skip 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 just skip do you have any other thoughts on world turning all right thumbs up down or medium i'm giving a thumbs up Oh, oh, yeah. oh. not my favorite, not my favorite, not my because I keep yeah, thinking like Mick there. doing this for 20 minutes. <laughs> What's your beef, dude? What is your but beef? Take away the Mick drum solo. How about the album? We're doing the album version. The album the version thumbs up at the, at under five minutes. Yes, <laughs> okay. What's worse? The <laughs> Rhiannon don't go, Rhiannon stay, or Mick's drum solo. World turning. <laughs> so, I guess a solo because it's twenty minutes long. With the electronic God. stuff. Yeah, help me. That's so God. campy. God. Oh. Help me. Help me. <laughs> okay, I'm speaking to the phonogenics audience that's watching this. If there's anybody out there that actually enjoys mixed drum solo on world turning, please leave a comment because we want to know if you're out there. <laughs> Make sure you post it on the ledge on the Fleetwood Mac side. Yeah, who? Uh, 
Is there? Well, I'll say this after the podcast. Okay. So yeah. moving on, we have two songs left. What I need is a sugar daddy. <laughs> Christine, you hear a car? You hear who's on the guitar in this song? You guys, who's car horn. You hear a car what horn? But who's it's playing twice. sugar daddy? Waddy. Waddy Wachtel. Yeah, Waddy. Making his first appearance and only appearance on a Fleetwood Mac album, right? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. He was, I don't know. Waddy Playing got the his, his bucket list. Waddy's bucket list. Be on the Poseidon Adventure and playing Fleetwood Mac. That's pretty good stuff. Great movie. <laughs> he was the Poseidon Adventure. Crazy stuff. Now, I feel like Sugar Daddy's probably the weakest of the Christy McVie songs, but I still love it. I mm. think it's just fun. I think it's a nice blues number. Uh, She's not looking for love. She's not asking for love. She just wants a little sympathy and money, apparently. Hey, money. Because I guess John's. <laughs> I guess John's not paying. He's not buying her he's the not providing. Purse. John's not providing. John's not providing. She needs a sugar daddy. <laughs> but when it comes, I to never like this. I never liked this song. I was like, Christine, get a job. Stop relying on sugar daddy. Get a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Roland's uh, not on board for That's sugar true. daddy. Any other thoughts, sugar daddy? I think it's just fun. Oh, <laughs> thumbs down. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Oh. Nathan, Sugar Daddy. Great song. Great song. All right, we're going to do Jim and Alicia. Okay. It's a another bouncy track. And the, and the car horn a couple times is kind of cool. Um, it's, it's bluesy, of course. And it has an Americana flair to it. I think in the words and the playing... Show it's, does. Do you know what else it, I fucking love? The fade out. Oh, I'm not asking for love. <laughs> Where it has them all. How, how's, the, the, how's the chorus go? Will you sing that for me? Well, when it comes to love, he better leave me alone. I don't okay. remember the song. No. <laughs> like, it's yeah. forgettable. <laughs> Steven. It definitely is filler, but I, I still love it. When, it's got charm. It's. It's a lot. I get a little hungry. <laughs> and when I need some whiskey, <laughs> it says it eat. to me neat. Because that rhymes with eat. If someone will buy it for me. You know what? I don't think Christy McVie ever wanted just a little whiskey. You know what I mean? Like, what a lot of whiskey. <laughs> the fact that she says she ever needs a little whiskey, like, we already know she's lying. <laughs> I don't think there's ever such thing as a little whiskey for McVie back in 75. <laughs> okay. Does anyone like this song besides me? I love it. I like Maybe it. You... Okay. G it's me. Absolutely. Yeah, like Jim. I, this week I've been playing it and I like it more than ever. I love it. Really? Okay, yeah. Alicia, Sugar Daddy. I think it's a fun song. It's, I mean, fun. it's one of those, I, I think maybe it's the weakest song on the record right there with Over My Head, but I mean, I mean it's fun. It's not, oh, wow. And when I heard it here the last time or two, the way that Christine does her words makes me think of Cher somewhat, just okay. her pronunciation, pronunciations uh. and everything. It, yeah. it made me recall, like how Cher sings. I had a friend once say, "Would the world explode if there was a a three part harmony between Cher, Christine McVie, and Michael McDonald?" Can you imagine? <laughs> oh my! Wow! Yeah, I, think I think the world would explode. <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> oh gosh! How interesting! <laughs> that, that probably there would be a disaster of work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll just forget Y2K. <laughs> forget Y2K to end the world. It'd That's be McDonald, right. McVie, and Cher did it. <laughs> Three part harmony. Okay, so Sugar Daddy, thumbs up, medium, or down? I'm giving it a thumbs up. Thumbs up. It's, it's yeah, not it's fun. You have to have it because it, it fills out the, the, the whole of the album. You know, yep. it, it fills, fills out the runtime. And you're dancing. No, it's just like you're hanging out on your. It's groovy. Oh, it's got it's a groovy. Five more minutes. It oh, I, Harbor. Yeah, it's it's a good song. It's a fun song. So did anyone else hear hear the early mix of Over My Head with the 
original McV piano? Has anyone heard it besides me? No, but I'm actually super curious since you said that because I uh, love. It sounds like it's pretty cool. Okay, it sounds a lot better than the very airy, fairy version. Um, yeah, so we paused it and did take a quick listen to the early take of "Over My Head." That has the original McV piano because I feel like she writes her songs on the piano, and that's probably how she actually wrote the song before Lindsay took out the piano part. So it felt much more authentically McV in the way that it just makes me love her so much. So I had to share it. Okay, we have one song left. Now, everyone here is probably going to disagree with me, but to me, just as excruciating as the 10-minute McFleetwood drum solo oh. is the 10-minute Lindsey Buckingham oh. I'm So Afraid guitar solo. <laughs> like, ugh. No. Like, we know, Lindsay. Like, you're going to act weird and crazy. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm So Afraid. Uh, a very haunting, dark song. I feel like yep. Stevie Nicks' harmonies on this are exquisitely witchy and beautiful. On the, This is a, one of the ones that I like the yeah, album really like version that. better. I know people go crazy for the live version, but I'm going to go against the grain and say I like the album version better. There's just okay. something about it that is so haunting and not as wacky. I don't know. but that's has Not as what? Time. Not as Wha what? It just got kind of wacky in the live. Like, Oh, I'm being I'm being so wacky and playing a crazy guitar solo and acting manic on stage. Being it all for what it's worth, yeah. Like I feel the song as a subtle, dark piece of work speaks for itself, and you don't need those like over the top theatrics for me. Yeah. And I'm probably get slaughtered in the comments. So someone else give a conflicting opinion. No, I agree <laughs> with you because it's under five minutes, and I'm happy with that. Yeah, it's just haunting. Oh. It's mostly what's drum. It's, Something about Mick Fleetwood's drums, the way they record, just has a really heavy tom that I think is just so awesome on this album version. I love this album version. Yeah. Is there anyone here that loves the live version with Lindsay's? Okay, Steven. Yeah, so it's all about the live version, I think. Really? This is the song where you, like, take a moment during the concert to, like, take in the experience around you. Okay. You know, you're not trying to, you know, count Stevie's eyelashes. You're just... <laughs> enjoying the atmosphere but for me okay jim what are your thoughts on the um it's a it's a very dark ex closer and Lindsay just kills it all the way through um god this, i trip and i fall and i die this, like, that's this, dark as fuck the, the way this it was written in that uh i call it the desperate era of buckingham next when there were uh paul door cut them loose it was probably written right after that because they didn't know what was going to happen. And Stevie wrote probably a good half dozen iconic songs, right? That's, that's probably, probably her best material group of her entire career when she yeah. was away. Yes. I mean, and Lindsay wrote this and it had that same sort of, you know, it's sort of desperate and uh, what's, What's the future hole? Lindsay couldn't. Stevie said he's hopeless and helpless without a guitar in his hand and and noodling around the studio. I mean, that's what he is. Has anyone ever found that coffee plant? That's <laughs> I've seen a picture of it. I've seen a picture of it. Have you seen a picture of it, Roland? Yes. You should. See I, I know the address. Roland. Somebody, somebody the, told me. Oh, the yeah. coffee. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's where they recorded these demos. Was in the coffee plant, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's the demos. It's a factory, but it's not selling coffee. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's still around. I have, I know where it is. Wow, but you live up there, Roland. Not now. I don't know, but I somebody oh. told me where it is and showed me a picture. Yeah. So, Alicia, had you ever heard the song before you took in this album? Um, yes, because I've seen Buckingham live twice. Okay. Um, hello. Um, oh, I love him live. Yeah. It's interesting that this was the last song. I mean, it. So I will confess, when I first picked up Fleetwood Mac in 07 and played their greatest hits for like all of a month before I did my right turn to Stevie Land, <laughs> I will admit at 19, I did not appreciate Buckingham. Okay. Um, he does a lot more. He's willing not to do the big solos and do all the grandiose thing that your solo guitarists typically do. Um, 
this is that one song on this record where he really seems to say, okay, I'm going to do that three minute solo and we're going to, you know, indulge. And I find that 19 year old me would have loved this song. Um, it took me years to understand that there is something about the lead guitarist saying, okay, I'm going to create a well-crafted <laughs> song and I don't have to have my, my guitar, you know, it, it could be everybody else, the piano, the this, the that, um, to help the song. <laughs> but um, listening to this, you really start realizing how good of a guitarist. Yes. And you realize, okay, why is he always at the bottom of the 100 greatest guitarist sort of things? Like, um, it yeah, all my snarky comments aside, I do have to say, he's an fucking amazing, one of the best guitarists of all time. So, I think yeah, he's one of the best. Yeah, he's, he's above bit, 20. Lindsay's above 20, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it, it's as I've gotten older, I've appreciated his philosophy of how he works the songs and, and performs. So that's not something when you're 18, you want that every <clears> song <throat> has that three minute solo. Um, and, he, and he picks with his friggin' hands. Yes. And it's, and it's a unique sound. It's a unique sound coming off the fingers. And not to beat a dead like horse, it. but I feel like the public started to really realize what when, great guitarist yeah. Lindsay was when the dance came out. Because he did the acoustic big love and everyone's like, oh, we didn't realize he could do this. So I feel like that's when people started to recognize him as a guitarist more so than before. So um, this is a real, it, it's interesting how they put this at the end. Um, it, it, it's a big epic song, kind of like Crystal is a slow. This seems to be kind of more of a rocker. Right. Um, this it, is the dirt. <laughs> huh? Yeah. But, um, um, when I first saw so afraid. Lindsay on you know video, uh, I'm seeing Lindsay picking with his fingers and that sound coming out. I said, "My God, I never right. seen it in my life." Yep. Jeez, that's just this guy is picking with his fingers on, you know. And I knew that all of that, you know, over time, you know, the stuff from, you know, what he's done and, and that sound, he, you know. What, what guitar player he is and then you see him live or a clip and man that was wow he is i mean i don't know why he doesn't make these uh i think a recent list he's like you know above 100 somewhere he wasn't included on guitar lists you know not you know some of them he's left off um i think people are I don't know. They they look at the guitar players in a different way, you know. Critics, I don't know. Right. It's unappreciated. Totally. That's what his brand. brand. What about his new album? Do you like that one, Jim? I haven't heard it. Is it good? No. What? It's a good one. It's a lot I thought fun. it had its moments. I thought it had its moments. Okay. Um. I'll make check that out. Uh. I think I, I'm kind of boycotting everybody because they're fighting and said, why don't you guys go with Christine, Stevie and Lindsay and make a Fleetwood Mac album. But that's, I think that's ship has sailed. Um, so you should boycott everyone. I agree with that. That's a good idea. I'm with you. There was some except John McVie. He's an innocent bystander. Except John. <laughs> get, I mean, Christine's come back and just put things aside and write, Two or three good songs for each one and go. The next album is going to be John McVie, Sharon Ceylani, <laughs> and uh, Brett Tuggle. And Brett Tuggle. <laughs> and it's called <laughs> The Cheryl Crow. And Lola, who is the one that was in John McVie's Got a Band? Lola. Oh, Lola Luda. Thomas. Yeah, Lola Thomas is going to be in. And Becca and Bramlett. John McVie's Got a Band. Becca Bramlett. Was she the one on time? No, no, it's Becca Bramlett. Yeah. All right. So I'm so afraid. Th I give it a thumbs up. Definitely. Oh, you guys, it's a great, song. great, uh, great uh, studio. Oh, version. Rocking good one in um, concert. That's is a good rocking one in concert. You have to have that. It's like go your own way. You've got to have that. In the and set. I will say, and then Jim, you'll be next. That I'm just yeah. not a big fan of guitar solos. Period. So it's nothing against Lindsay. It's just a personal okay. preference. So uh, go ahead, Jim. 
yeah, can you think of any other like Skinner or someone else that would do a, a long extended? Tom Petty and you know Mike Campbell would run stuff like this too. But who up? In, oh, I I I noticed and listened to it recently. There's a lot of Peter Green there. Oh yeah, a lot of uh, what it just it might not be the how it's played, but how it feels. There's a lot of green, dark, really Manalishi in there or something. It's a dark, dark song. Yeah. I mean, they were like, God, Polidor kicks them out and they don't know what they're doing. And Stevie writes great stuff. And, and Lindsay writes this. I think he was working on secondhand news and, and some of the rumor stuff in that period too. Going your own way with might've been, no, that was probably when. See, I feel like that came a little bit later. Yeah, that came. But I think. Him uh, and Stevie were still getting along gish at this point. Yeah. But, you know, you don't know what's kind of a little bit of a, a lick and is kind of put on the shelf. And Yeah, and, right. Uh, the germ of ideas. They're always like like that Stevie with uh, 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 Dave Stewart, and they couldn't find that lick he made where you were just freewheeling it. And mm. Steven, that's the solo. <laughs> that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And, and you know, they 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 kind of mentally put a you know uh, a lick on a shelf and say, "Hey, this one, I'm going to look at that one again." And there could have been stuff that you know was, is sitting around. And it's smart to record everything you do. I think every guitarist has to be doing that. If they pick it up, it's got to be. You know, you might play the best thing. And if it's not recorded, you, it's gone. All right, so time to end the episode by our usual. Yeah. We're going to rank the album on a scale of one to ten. Okay, boy, this is a. And you know what? I'm going to usually I do it last, but I'm going to start this time. I'm going to give it a ten. I think it's perfect from beginning to end. They oh, had boy. one. They have ones that are maybe more popular, but I I feel like this the sterling level of Fleetwood Mac greatness. I'm there for the sugar daddy. I'm there yeah. for uh, I'm there for warm ways. I'm there for it all. Okay, Nathan, you give it a ten. No, I'm gonna give it a nine. A nine. Yeah. All right, Jim, what do you give it? Uh, nine point eight. Nine point eight, Stephen. I, I don't even know how to rate this album. <laughs> to be honest, well, like, uh, like is it? I don't know. I guess I'll give it an eight. An eight? Yeah. Roland. Uh, give it a nine or so. I'm taking a point off for Sugar Daddy. <gasps> oh. You get a job. You get a you job. Better, you better go drink right, some of that whiskey neat. For Sugar Daddy. <laughs> you better get some of that whiskey neat. And Wadi Wachtel. Okay. Alicia. <laughs> Fleetwood Mac self-titled. Scale of one to ten. Yeah. Mm. It's kind of hard because... I think it's a really solid record. It, it really is. But, um, you know, eight or nine, maybe 10. I mean, well, I mean, it, it's a solid record. It, they definitely all brought their best songs to this record. Um, I feel if rumors hadn't come along, this album would have been the iconic one. But then, and that's also kind of hard because you're, you're kind of going, okay, I'm sitting here. Huh. I don't know where to rank it. Because there's always like in the back of your mind, but there's rumors coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but this is a really, really great record. I mean, it, it's, it definitely is. There's, I mean, I think Sugar Daddy is fat, but then at the same point in time, it all, it all gels together. I, it all works. And when you're playing it, it, it just flows. And I like how world turning is kind of like a duet. Mm -hmm. And then you have crystal. That's kind of like a duet. So it's like this balance. It's almost like they had. And the other thing with this record is this is before all the ego set in with rumors. And yes. And so you have a lot more. They're willing to more give with each other. There's. So it, it makes it interesting, I guess, is the other thing. Um, There's a lot of sincerity here that never got duplicated, I feel like. Yes. So that's oh. also really hard. Um, 
So I don't know exactly how to place all of it. I Did you say Sugar Daddy was bad or fab? To me, it's probably the worst song on okay. the record. But it's not a bad, bad song. It's kind of that song where maybe in five years, I probably would skip it if I was playing this record over and over again. To me, it's, it's a good song. But it, it's the filler song off the record. Right. That makes any do sense. Do you guys still play this record? Yeah, I do. I okay. like Sugar Daddy. Because Sugar Daddy reminds me of like a, it's been, all these songs have been on greatest hits, live compilations and stuff. And that's how I know the material. I don't really know this collection of songs as an album. See, I love that's it as a body of work. To rate it. No, I play Tusk. I, I think I've listened to this album all the way through maybe three times. But I've heard all the songs, like in different. You have to listen to this if you want to hear Crystal, because I don't think Crystal is anywhere else. Is that true? Is that correct? I haven't heard it on any of the greatest. Pull up the MP3 though. You don't have to go to the album anymore. Okay. So I missed that experience. Like I didn't discover this as an album, really. Like. And I do feel like the ride of this as an album is such a perfect flow of everything, like a hundred percent. Yeah. Sugar Daddy included. Thank you very much. Yes, it, and that's what makes that song work. Um, damn, this is the album that brought us Landslide and Rhiannon. Yes. Yeah. God, can you imagine a world without Rhiannon and Landslide? I give it a 12. <laughs> I give it a 12 out of 10. See, Greatest Hits brought me Rhiannon. <laughs> oh! <laughs> it also brought you No Questions Asked, which I love. Yes, I do too. I like it. <laughs> We're not going to talk about it as long as you follow them. Jim. Yes, this album, I mean, there was, it was that country rock era, but this had a little, it had a, you know, that punch of Mick and John. If you bring the Anglo and the Ameri American thing together. Oh, yeah. Just a good marriage. And it's very influential even today. You know, country music, uh, a lot of country music is like this. You know, in some ways, alternative music has a lot of these things in it. The way things are sung and written and played and produced. This is a, it's, I mean, if, if, if Fleetwood, if this didn't happen, I mean, the beat music would be really different. Yeah. I mean, there, there'd just be, it, you know, what would be the slant on what's, if, if this didn't happen? And the rumors is another damn thing. <laughs> so thank you, Fleetwood Mac, for making the album, Fleetwood Mac. You changed our lives. Thank you, Fleetwood Mac. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I'm going to pause it and we can still talk for a second. But thank you to all the viewers. Uh, isn't it great to have the Fleetwood Mac panel back? We're going to be here. It is. It is. It is. Moving forward through the discography. Thank you to everyone that subscribes to my Patreon. Just so everyone knows where their money went this month, I released deluxe editions of my last two albums. So thank you for supporting that. It felt so good to reclaim my last two albums and put them out the way I wanted them. Uh, and then thanks to all the YouTube subscribers and to my Wait. friends for loving Fleetwood Mac, even though you put down Sugar Daddy. Whatever. All right. Till next time when we tackle rumors. Bye.